It looks like people are settled on time. Welcome. Thank you. 6 p.m. here on our regularly scheduled Thursday, March 23rd, 2023 City Council meeting. May we please have a roll call? Here. 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 Would you all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. All right. Do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? Staff has no changes to the agenda this evening. Thank you. We do have a presentation tonight. Um, it's 3A. We have the annual update from 3CE. I think she's muted. It looks like she's talking, but... Sophia, we can't hear you if you're speaking. Oh, I think we can hear, but the Little volume better. is really low. Mm -hmm. How, how about you? A little bit better. Can you hear me okay? Can we turn it up on our end? No. I don't think it's a problem on our end. Still quite muffled. Oh, Rob's is. Rob, can we try your mic? See how that goes? How about now? Testing. Ooh, there we go. Much better. Wonderful. Yeah. Sorry about that. Thank you for your patience. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Sophia Schwartzke, and I am a Customer Accounts Manager with Central Coast Community Energy, or 3CE. I am excited to be here with you this evening to speak with you about the agency's recent accomplishments, along with our plans for 2023 and beyond. So let me start with a brief overview of Community Choice Aggregation, for those tuning in tonight who may be less familiar with the concept. 3CE is a Community Choice Aggregator, or CCA. Once a community joins a CCA, the CCA will take over the responsibility for electricity procurement from the existing investor-owned utility. The investor-owned utility will continue to provide energy transmission, delivery, metering, and billing services. CCAs are public agencies that return revenue to the communities they serve through programs, incentives, and rebates. CCAs can also assist with local job creation and prioritize um, clean and renewable energy in their procurement efforts. 3CE was formed in 2017, and since then, the agency has seen tremendous expansion. We've gone from serving the Monterey Bay to the entire Central Coast, and um, the city of Capitola joined 3CE in 2018. Today, 3CE is made up of 34 member agencies in five counties. The agency serves nearly 450,000 customers and has secured over $1 billion in renewable energy and storage agreements while returning $26 million to the communities we serve. 94% of eligible customers are enrolled with 3CE, and last year alone, the agency delivered over 5,000 gigawatt hours of electricity to our customers. In the last year and a half, we enrolled Buellton, completed the enrollment of unincorporated regions of Santa Barbara County, and welcomed the city of Atascadero to 3CE. And I'm excited to say that on Tuesday, the county of San Luis Obispo voted to join 3CE. So there's a lot of news to report, uh, but for tonight, I'd like to focus on the four major benefits promised to our communities when we formed in 2017. I'm going to start with local control. Um, community choice aggregation allows local governments to have greater control over the type and cost of electricity provided to their communities 
to ensure energy sources and rates reflect the community's values and goals. With 3CE, decisions about where your power come from and how much it costs are made by local elected officials. We're making progress on climate goals together as a region, and 3CE is far ahead of both state and federal targets to decarbonize our energy supply. Here in Capitola, you share board seats with the city of Scotts Valley, and you're currently represented by Councilmember Brooks and City Manager Goldstein. So let me talk about rates. In March of 2022, we decoupled our rates from PG&E's and established our own rate setting procedures based on cost of service, resulting in an average of 18% in savings for our residential customers. Small and medium commercial customers saved between 2 and 19% after we made this change, and we expect our competitiveness with the incumbent investor-owned utility to continue. Now I'd like to shift focus to our efforts to procure clean and renewable power. Today, 3CE procures 50% of our electricity from clean and renewable sources, and we are on track to procure 60% of our energy from clean and renewable sources by 2025, which is five years ahead of the same goal set by the state of California. 3CE is committed to meet 100% of our demand with clean and renewable sources by 2030, which is an entire 15 years ahead of the same goal set by the state of California. So 3CE prioritizes long-term contracts that bring new clean and renewable resources online as quickly as possible. 3CE has executed 19 long-term power purchase agreements and energy storage agreements. 3CE is also pursuing offshore wind generation and emerging technology in California. Five of those projects I mentioned on the last slide came online in 2022. These five projects are serving about 22% of 3CE's annual load. And finally, on the topic of clean and renewable energy is electrification. The biggest impact we can make as individuals to cut greenhouse gases and improve air quality is to replace our fossil fuel vehicles with electric vehicles and to replace the gas appliances in our home with electric versions. So as 3CE works to clean the grid, electric vehicles and appliances will be emissions free in their operation and the electricity that powers them will be 100% clean and renewable. Finally, I'd like to speak with you about 3CE's continued investment in Capitola and into all the communities we serve. Over the past three years, 3CE has helped put more than 1,000 electric vehicles on Central Coast roads by distributing more than $2 million in cash rebates paid directly to our customers. These EVs have spared more than 6,000 metric tons of regional CO2 emissions. And in collaboration with funding partners like the California Energy Commission, 3CE has delivered rebates that will help build more than 1,000 new electric vehicle charging stations for our region. Um, 3CE has also funded more than 2,000 all electric affordable housing units. 3CE's residential customers are eligible for rebates towards electric vehicles, EV charging stations and readiness, electric appliances, and the construction of new all-electric accessory dwelling units. 3CE has programs aimed at helping our member agency partners advance fleet electrification, fleet charging infrastructure, and staying up to date with building codes that advance electrification. 3CE also has business-friendly programs designed to upgrade ag equipment, electrify farm worker housing, and to install DCFC level three chargers. With an understanding that some of these programs may be inaccessible for our underserved community members, 3CE also provides additional Electrify Your Ride and Electrify Your Home rebates for income qualified customers. And um, in partnership with the state, 3CE has garnered $1,193,000 for your community. So if you were interested in any of the programs featured on the previous slides, pre please head to our website, 3cenergy.org. And if you were interested in learning more about any of the member agency programs I spoke about, I'd love to get you in touch with your account manager, Judy Young. With the continued support of the Capitola City Council, city staff, and community members, 
3CE will continue to deliver impactful programs, exemplary service, and clean and renewable energy. Thank you so much for your time tonight, and I would love to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you so much. Council, do we have any questions? All right, any questions from the public? Great, thank you so much, Sophia. Thank you, have a great night, everyone. You too. All right, so that'll bring us down to additional materials. Great, thank you. So we'll move on to oral communications by members of the public. Um, this is on anything that is not on tonight's agenda. Anybody from the public is welcome to speak. You'll have three minutes. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is John Haken, and I live at uh, Cabrillo Mobile Home uh, Park on Red Rosedale Avenue. As the council is aware, our landlord, Vieira Enterprises, will be raising our rent by $358 a month a rise of 58%. Assembly Bill AB 1035 is to place a cap on rent increases for mobile home parks. I and, I and several others consider it's very important that the city of Capitola support this bill AB 1035 to prevent such outrageous rent increases for mobile home park, mobile homeowners. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good evening, Mayor and uh, Council Members. Uh, my name is Jerry Jensen. Um, tonight, I come in front of you to talk about um, we have an ad hoc committee that we have pulled together of uh, community members, um, and uh, we are um, going to form a group, and we're going to be called the Capitore. Capital Wharf Enhancement Team. Um, so we'll be CWET as we're going to be referring to ourselves as an acronym. Um, and with these, um, we'll be raising funds to enhance and um, to provide enhancements um, as Wharf is getting rebuilt. Um, our community members that we have brought together um, are Carrie Arnone, Christine McBroom, Gail Ortiz, Arn Hanna, Heidi Kellison, Scott McConville, Joe Polidrani, uh, Lori Hill, Rich Novak, Vicki Gwynn, and myself. Um, with our group that we are working with, we um, have started working with uh, city staff, and we are um, just now getting get, um, starting to get ready to have a public information release um, and news um, uh, blurb uh, get sent out about what we plan to um, do and help enhance the wharf. Some of our ideas are around lighting, some historical signage seating enhancement. Like I said, we are going to make sure we reach out to the community um, and we're going to have a community workshop and work with uh, Jamie and Jessica with that. Um, with that, we'll be doing a fundraiser program um, and we'll be raising funds for this to help um, make the wharf, I guess, um, a more enhanced, uh, more of a, a place that when the community feel like they all had a little bit more of a buy-in um, to a final design of enhancements with that. Um, there will be some community um, communication releases that are going, going out to the community real soon. Uh, one of our um, members of our board was um, Scott McConville, and he's with the Wharf to Wharf. Um, it's great that they have decided to join with us in helping do community outreach. And so they're going to be sending out some information next week when they are notifying everybody about race registra registration. After the registration is over, they're going to be working with us in doing fundraising and not just up until the time of the race, they agreed to kind of stay on with us through our whole entire campaign. So they've really become a great member of our team. And I plan to come back at multiple different times and bring back updates about what our group is doing. So um, appreciate your time and thank you. Thank you, we look forward to the updates. Any other 
Members, hi. Yes, hi. Thank you. I'm Douglas Castle. I'm also a resident of the mobile home, uh, Cabrillo Mobile Home Estates, uh, as well as my uh, neighbor, John, and some of any of my other neighbors who have joined us here today. And I just want to back up what John said and why that assembly bill um, 1035 is so important, uh, as well as any ideas um, or support we might ask of uh, the council in the future. We have some ideas and that we're working on, we might ask for certain help. Mobile homes have a special, you know, really special place in the housing market. They are more accessible and they offer a pathway of home ownership to many people who are otherwise placed out of the homes. Even with vouchers, there, you know, often there's restrictions on those so people aren't, you know, it's not always a pathway for everyone. Whereas mobile homes are a pathway for everyone at that housing level. Um, so I think it's really important because they are very diverse by that nature because so many people can go in there. I know there's often a thought of mobile homes or trailer parks and popular culture, and they might bring up, you know, numerous stereotypes that you can think about um, that can be humorous at times. But really in the California mobile homes and the parks, you get many, many people, many families with um, a lot of diversity. If you ever go up there to our park, to our neighborhood, walk around, you will see for yourself. Uh, that there's a great deal of um, diversity at many levels. So I think it's really important if Capitola is a city and the council uh, of Capitola really mm -hmm. do consider things such as diversity, equity, and inclusion as principles to work on supporting our mobile home park and our, the stability of our residents, I would hope would be a, something you would strongly consider as we can move, you know, as we move forward. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathleen Bear. I live on Capitola Avenue, and I don't know if this is the place to bring it up, but I've noticed the motorized bicycles coming down the street at high speeds with small children in boxes in the front. The, two days ago, uh, since there's no bike lanes there, there's not, I don't know if they're supposed to ride with the cars or over to the side, but there was one riding near the middle of the lane where cars would be. Well, he almost, uh, you know, came extremely close. The guy ran off onto the sidewalk to get away from the car and almost hit a person. <laughs> so I was like, I've just seen high speeds. And when I saw this father with a little girl about two years old in a box on the front, and uh, then the trail by the creek, there is a sign by the trestle that says, walk your bicycles. I was walking my dog there and I was under the trestle down by the creek and two big motorized bicycles came like teenagers and they came riding down and almost <laughs> cleaned me off the path with my dog because they took a blind turn to the right. And I noticed that there's not a sign at the end nor uh, near uh, the high part of the creek. There's no sign there that says walk your bicycles and there's no sign uh, by the bridge, only in the middle, I think it is. Maybe I don't, I know there's only one, but I, it, I think there should be one everywhere because just me alone, I've seen, I've almost been crashed into also skateboards. They are allowed up to the trestle and there's not enough room like there's a telephone pole in the sidewalk where I live and uh, a skateboard came and almost crashed into me. Then regular bicycles, there's another telephone pole with this much room and two kids on a bicycle were on the sidewalk and I had to jump inside like the alcove for a storefront. So that was just regular, but it just seems like a lot is going on with those uh, motorized bicycles on the back, the street, right river side, Riverview Avenue. There were two motorized bicycles, a guy with a huge box with two big dogs and I don't know, girlfriend or wife on another one. And I had to jump to the side because they were coming over towards, I was on the very edge because there's not a sidewalk back there. 
So I just think it's extremely dangerous. And I didn't know if I should call the police since tell them what I've seen and, you know, no, no signage either. They need more of that. Thank you very much. We have other in-person members. <clears throat> okay, seeing none, we can go out to Zoom. Okay. Thank you. Well, this will take us to um, city council comments. Do we have any from our members? Just a quick comment. Yeah. Um, based on the comment that we've just received, I'd like to ask staff to bring back an agenda item with information for the council to consider about sending a letter of support for AB 1035. It's uh, Assembly Member Merit Suchi. It's still in the first house. It was referred to the Assembly, Commember, or Assembly Committee on Housing and Community Development uh, recently, like a couple weeks ago, on the, on the 2nd of March. Um, so we still have plenty of time if it could come back to us um, fairly soon just for us to consider as an entire body, uh, sending a letter of support for that. Thank you. I wanted to make a quick update about Operation Surf. It was in town a couple weeks ago here in Capitola. It was another great event. Fortunately, it was one of the rare days where we had some sun and some clean water and waves. And it was uh, great that Capitola is still a part of it. They had some great things to say about the city. And uh, it was really fun to be out there with all those veterans and Operation Surf. So. Any other comments? Do we have staff comments? One quick update is, is we've gotten the device, uh, we've secured the device to lower the lighting for the new bottled lighting <laughs> on, <laughs> on next to Noble Mills <laughs> Park. So after the meeting this evening, council members are encouraged to go by. Uh, there are some other settings lower, so it can go lower uh, than it is right now. So curious about people's feedback. And then I think Nikki Bryant has a short update as well. Great. Hi, Nikki. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. Um, as many of you are aware, this past Tuesday, we had to cancel the planned um, UA playground community meeting due to the storm. Uh, that The meeting has been rescheduled and will take place on March 29th, which is next Tuesday at the same time, 7 to 9 p.m. at the Jade Street Capitola Community Center. Thank you. Thanks for that update. Follow up for Nikki. Nikki. Oh, sorry, Nikki. I think we have a follow up. I know. Sorry. Get your steps in. Sorry, Nikki. Okay, I'll I'll learn to stay here longer. <laughs> um, do you want to give us an update on the summer programs that we just we summer? Sure. Oh, yeah, whatever. On, on registration? Yeah, on camps. And yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so we opened junior guard registration this past week, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, and the all of session one for junior guards is full with long wait lists. Um, session two does have some PM session availability, if anybody is still looking to register. Um, Camp Capitola also opened registration the week prior, and um, just about all sessions are have one or two spaces left, but wait lists will be forming very soon for Camp Capitola. So if anybody is interested, I encourage them to register soon. Are there scholarships still available? Yes, there is scholarships available. Um, the, a, an individual would go ahead and, and do the registration process. And then on our website, as well as the um, Capitola Public Safety and Community Foundation, the application is available through them. They would fill out the application um, and then submit it to the Community Foundation and then we would communicate with them about any scholarships that would be awarded to their account directly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go on to item seven, which is our consent items. <clears throat> They'll be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. Do I have a motion? Move approval of consent. Second it. Hey, we have a motion and a second. May we have a roll call, please? Aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. It'll take us on to general government. We have item 8A. This is the temporary village parking committee recommendations. The recommended action here tonight is to direct staff to prepare the necessary documentation to approve the temporary village parking committee recommendations. And Jim's here to present. Yes, I am. Our city clerk is getting the presentation up. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, as the Mayor just mentioned, this is for the Temporary Village Parking Committee. Um, um, as you, some of you may recall, the committee was formed last April and consisted of three city residents, three village business representatives one member from our finance advisory committee and two members of the city council. Um, support was provided by the police department, public works department, community development and finance departments. The committee met seven times during the summer and fall of last year. I'm reviewing everything from parking meter rates to permits, parking signage, and potentially renaming the upper and lower beach and village lots here behind city hall. Um, <clears throat> Um, some of the things that uh, the goals of the committee were to examine the parking meter rates, uh, look at the equity between permit costs and the utility of village parking, um, examine changes to the parking program rules to encourage folks to use these lots that are behind City Hall, and um, evaluate other opportunities to re reduce parking in the neighborhoods and get more folks out of the neighborhoods and into the lots behind City Hall. Um, just as a reminder, the parking committee did not review meter zone areas, parking permit program boundaries, or consider any new parking meter areas or permit areas. Wow. Doesn't like that one. Uh, some of the information that was reviewed um, was we looked at parking rates from other cities on, on California coast. We reviewed the rules and boundaries of the existing parking permit program, both in the village as well as in the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, we reviewed the parking meter and permit per, uh, revenue over, um, basically since 2009, which was the last time that the parking rates were increased. We looked at um, inflation since that last update. We considered um, potential zoning and policy changes. Also to see if there was any CEQA compliance and then um, locate, we talked a lot about different uh, locations for signage throughout the city. And then also the uh, Coastal Commission opinion, whether they supported the direction that we were going in and then what the permitting process would be. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the committee discussed uh, also discussed various parking rate structures. Uh, so we we talked about doing uh, variable rates for peak season and non-peak seasons. We also talked about creating some free parking areas in the back of the lower Beach and Village parking lot, trying to get folks encouraged over there. Ultimately, um, the consensus was to keep the program as simple as possible, just a, a consistent rate and consistent areas all throughout. Um, another observation of the committee is that a lot of visitors encounter difficulties with the pay stations that we currently have, and that um, we should look into potentially ease of use should be a consideration as we replace those um, as they kind of hit the end of their life. Did you say they were being replaced? I'm sorry, could I? As they need to be replaced, gotcha. not ahead of time, um, although some will be replaced from the storm. <laughs> Um, a couple other things that we looked at was, uh, or observations was the parking permit, the committee felt that the parking permit program is working as intended, with the exception of possibly some equity for the transferable permits that we'll get into a little bit. Um, another observation was to utilize consistent signage and increasing that signage. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but it was uh, the sign, the new sign that we have at the end of Stockton and Cap App with the surfboard and the all day parking to try to get a consistent sign in that style throughout the city. Um, and then another observation was some of the recommendations could potentially increase revenues for the city and some of those revenues could be utilized towards 
enhancing the par parking program, maybe doing the signage and upgrading some of the parking stations. Um, that worked actually. So as far as the committee's recommendations, uh, as far as parking meter rates, the re recommendation is to increase the rates from $1.50 an hour to $2 an hour and maintain the three hour maximum. Um, increase parking rates from $1 to $2 per hour on Cliff Drive and maintain the 12 hour maximum up there. Increase parking rates from 50 cents an hour to $1 an hour in the upper and lower beach and village parking lots and also maintain the 12 hour maximum there. Um, all three of those combined, based on kind of what our, our his parking revenue history would generate about $400,000 of additional parking revenue. As far as parking permits, um, the, on the permit side, the first recommendation was to add holidays as a parking permit requirement on Fanmar Terrace, as well as the 300 block of San Jose. Currently, that's only, <clears throat> excuse me, restricted on weekends and it gets pretty jammed up on holidays up there as well. Um, the surf and coffee permits increase from $50 to $55 per year, and also increase the number of permits from 75 to 100. Um, we recently, a couple of years ago, increased from 50 to 75, and I think those go out the door probably the first week that, they, that they're available. Um, as far as the transferable permits, um, I've broken those into kind of two categories. There's the commercial hotels. I think in the staff report, I erroneously listed Capitola Hotel. It should be commercial and hotels. Um, increase that from $50 to $365 annually. Um, I'm going to come back to those in a second. On the transferable permits for residential, no change to those. Leave those at the $50 in annual. Um, and as far as the commercial and hotels to also reevaluate some of the restrictions that we currently put on those permits, I think the biggest one is they can't park along the seawall and there's a couple of other areas. Um, but to just reevaluate that, if the price of the permit is going up, maybe they can expand that area. Um, so the, the hotels, there was a lot of discussion on, on the commercial hotel. There's basically we issue, I, th I thought it was 10, I found out it's 13. 10 of them to Capitola Hotel, three of them to uh, Beach Suite Inns uh, behind the, the uh, Venetian. They have 10 rooms with only seven spaces, so they buy three of them. And I believe the Capitola Hotel has 10 rooms and they purchase 10. Um, we, we, we had anywhere from leaving it at $50 and taking it all the way up to $3,400, which is what restaurants pay for the same space for outdoor dining. <laughs> but the difference is outdoor dining, those are blocked off and exclusively used for, out, for the outdoor dining program. The permits that the hotels get aren't locked down. It's a great permit if there's available parking. The problem is in the peak season, the summer, a lot of times they give out the permits and there's no place for them to park anyways. So <clears throat> the committee thought a dollar a day was a, a reasonable, it's a big increase percentage wise, but a reasonable cost for um, for those hotel permits, the um, owners of the Capitola Hotel came in and, and obviously would have some concerns about that increase, but um, could could support it. But their issue, and it was really outside of the parking permit committee, parking committee was um, getting a space similar to what the outdoor dining does with third, pay thirty four hundred dollars and have that space in front of their hotel. What I don't know is um, if the Coastal Commission pushes back on that. I think we got some pushback on outdoor dining and they finally kind of let that up, but um, we could we could look into that <clears throat> for sure. Um, so that was parking permits. Um, as far as signage, excuse me. Again, <clears throat> replace the existing signs with the uh, surfboard design to be consistent throughout the whole village. Um, install, I have parking sites, banners basically on Cap Ave as you come down Cap Ave from Bay, right before you get to the entrance here, and then put banners over Bay Avenue by the lower lot entrance and up by uh, Monterey and Park over the entrance to the upper lot, just to <clears throat> kind of make it more visible for people coming in and visiting where the parking is. Um, also, they suggested that we work with the county and the U.S. Postal Service to change the address right now, the address to those parking lots is 426 Cap Ave, which is down at the bottom of the hill and there's no signage there. So as people drive by, they hit the yellow house, I don't know, that's probably a 500, then it's 
were in the 420s and they've gone past and now they're down on the village and back to traffic. So um, the process is to work with the assessor and the postal service. I've talked a little bit to our building official about that and um, that's definitely doable. If we did that change, then we could reach out to all of the um, mapping apps because right now they pin to where the address is. So if we can change the address, it changes their pin and it would, we hope, help people see that there's a better way to get to those parking lots rather than coming down Cap Ave and then missing the entrance there. <clears throat> um, couple other items, thank you, was um, renaming the upper and lower beach and village parking lots to um, Capitola Beach and Village Lot 1 and Lot 2. And I think more importantly was to make sure that the sign signage going in there indicated that that is all day parking. And then um, another recommendation was for city staff to explore options to notify motorists when parking is full. Um, we talked about similar to what they do in airport parking lots where when the lot's full, they kind of direct you to another one. I think we've looked into that in the past, back in 2009, and it's incredibly expensive, but we haven't looked into if there's other alternatives recently. So we could um, explore to see if there's anything available to where once the once it's filled up, is there any way to kind of redirect people so they don't get jammed up down there, um, basically in a parking lot for half hour to get out of there? Um, so as far as the recommended action is to uh, direct staff to prepare the necessary documentation to approve the temporary village committee recommendations. I'd like to add, I have a couple of members from the committee here in the audience that may or may not want to speak. And I believe the owner of the Capitola Hotel is also here. I mean, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, did you did you look into the reverb? Mm -hmm. okay. 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 Sorry, thank you for looking into it. Um, do we have any council questions? Can he use the mic for now, Jamie? Well, and sure. turn whatever he was using off. I can't concentrate as much. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, so the first question I have is about the signage. Was there any conversation about starting the signage as far back as the entry off the freeway? I know that arts and cultural talked about it a long time ago about making some sort of signage there. Was there any? Yeah, there was um, discussion about adding some signage on Park Avenue, straight down Park. And then Mm -hmm. um, we talked about there's a sign, it's a small sign that kind of standard blue with the white P, e, Bay and Cap Ave that it's really small and it points both directions, just getting rid of that and possibly putting the surf surfboard style sign, just directing people to continue straight up Bay Avenue rather than down. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but that wasn't part of the... As far as the recommendation, we didn't to... have specific sites. We did a lot of looking at maps and stuff, and which is kind of, I think we would probably leave that up to public works. I think there's some challenges on different locations, but just trying to put as many as we can along the bay. Along the okay, maybe that'd be something fun for art and cultural to look at just the bay porter exit onto, you know, exit and then. Some signage there. Um, you talked about letting folks know that the parking lots are full. Does our sign ordinance, I'm thinking of like A frames, like that are just simple, like parking lots full. Does that prohibit us from using that kind of method, which seems pretty straightforward that we have to Yeah, yeah. like the A frame sandwich board signs that says parking lot full. But I, I <laughs> so we can, we can, and we actually do deploy that sort of signage for our uh, summer shuttle program. Um, I think the trick with it is, is that we would need somebody monitoring the lot on weekends, which we don't have right now. Do we have public works mo monitoring yeah. the Esplanade, right? Is well, that, we're talking about putting the sign up at the Esplanade saying- Is that what you're referring to? I think that's what I was thinking just the parking, lot, the new, what is it, the new name, parking lot one and two. Um, if it's oh. full, having Public Works deploy their A-frame that just says 
parking lot. Full. I thought the point of the full sign was to show that Esplanade was full and to direct people oh, to just the, the beach and village parking lots. But that requires like sensors, right? In the parking spaces? Correct. Or okay. or somebody, or somebody physically monitoring. standing down mm -hmm. monitoring. Okay. You just have the challenges. camera. Or can you have a camera and somebody in an office update a digital sign? Get Jerry's drone. Awesome. Get Jerry's drone. <laughs> so we did actually several years ago, we priced out a system that would include sensors that would count cars going in and out of the lots, and then also sensors potentially on each parking space with digital signs. Um, it is feasible, but it's expensive. So there is an option to do something like that, but it's, if I remember right, when we looked at it probably 10 years ago, it was a $300,000 project. Wow. So it might be a half million today. Mm -hmm. or maybe it's gone down. You know, with technology, sometimes those prices don't elevate same way uh, other inflationary items do. So just for the general lot full, what's our process there for parking lot one and two? Do we have A-frames that go out? We we can. We're not limited by our ordinance to put A-frames out. I, I just, I'm not sure pragmatically how, how we would staff that. Do we have public works working on weekends? We do. Um, but they're not hanging out in the lot. You know, they're down picking up trash. They're, they're moving, they're mobile around the village rather than the city, rather than stationed up at the lot. So the meters, something's happening on my computer. Um, so the meters though, there is a process in which we could be notified that all meters are occupied, right? So in parking lot one and two, it's metered run. And I'm sure they're, instead of spending $300,000 on something, we could get, there's got to be some way to know that all of them are full. I think I'd need to talk a little bit more with our parking staff to find out kind of exactly what sort of data they have access to um, yeah. and exactly what the implications. I think one of the challenges with what you're suggesting is, is that. We got a notification. I don't know that we know it's challenging yet. My point is like, is there an opportunity there to, to get notified that they're full? And if they're full, we notify staff that's working to walk out and put a a frame down that's that yeah, says I can parking talk to our staff and see if that's a feasible option okay um the meters themselves are beloved meters so we're going to be replacing some of them that are not working but we're using the same type i just know we've gone back and forth about the meters not being the best the pay stations that were damaged during the storm are probably going to have to be replaced like they call it a, a, a light change it has to be replaced with basically right. exactly the same thing so those few that were damaged during the storm i and i don't know if it was the whole pay station or just some of the electronic components mm -hmm. inside but i imagine those will be replaced uh, like kind exchanges um as they kind of hit the end of their useful life and we have to replace them just because they're just time to be replaced i think that's the time when we we would start reevaluating if that's the best one um i think the chief is there but it's a it's a small world. You the parking yeah, meter, yeah. parking meter, and and all of that stuff is a very small world, and there's not a ton of options out there, unfortunately. Okay, so we're happy with them for what they are, and then we'll replace them as needed. Do we have a percent? Sorry, I have two more questions. Um, the percentage increase to the meters or to the rates from the one to let me pull it up so I don't misspeak. The one to two dollars or the one to one fifty to two. One fifty to two, thanks. Um, there it is. One fifty to two. What was the thought behind like the percentage increase? Where did that come from? So we looked at um inflation over the period from 2009 up until when we were meeting last week. And if if we had just followed inflation with the dollar fifty an hour, it would have been somewhere in like the two twenty-five range. So um, we settled in at two. At one point when we were talking about variable rates, we had talked about $4 in the summer and $2 in the winter or yeah. some some combination like that. But that that one seemed a little confusing. So we were just kind of following what inflation would be. And then I think that's the plan going forward when we submit to the Coastal Com um, Commission is to be able to just stay with inflation um, going forward rather than have to... Is that in, in alignment with all the other cities in our yes. county? So yes. everyone has a $2... Uh, right. They're a little bit higher um, in Santa Cruz than we are. I think they're at 225 right now. Um, different cities have different rates and different programs, and there's a lot of different reasons why they do it. Um, Carmel yeah. doesn't charge for parking, but they write a ton of parking tickets. <laughs> um, 
there's uh, Santa Barbara has a thing where it's free for 75 minutes and then they start charging, but they have parking garages. So it was, it was easier. Um, but $2 is, is pretty much kind of right in the middle of where everybody is. Okay. And then um, do they talk about coming back with a future increase to get to the 225 in like two years? Like what's the plan? Hopefully what we want to do is have the ability to adjust by inflation each year. So the council would have, we would, present to the council and say, you know, it's $2. Inflation would take it to $2 and five cents. Probably doesn't make sense. So we sit on it for two for a few years, follow that out. And then when it makes sense to go to the next change, we would do that. But it would be at council discretion Annually. rather than having to go through the Coastal Commission. Annually, is that what you said? It would come back to I would annually? suggest annually, just looking at it as part of the fee schedule. Okay, and then the last question is the pretty large increase to the hotel from 50 to 365, have they been notified? So you, you mentioned they were notified or one of them was notified. The Capitol the Hotel was notified. Um, and so were there any other options? Uh, as you said, the 3,400 for the space option, was that discussed with both of them and before Not being- Beach Suites. I just learned about Beach Suites yesterday. So I need to reach out to them. Um, with Capitola Hotel, I think their challenge- there's multiple challenges depending on whether we're talking about the fencing up right now, get back to having all open spaces and back to normal outdoor dining, but the loading zone doesn't line up with their hotel. Mm -hmm. and so they're, and it, it gets um, used by the restaurants and the businesses there for their deliveries. So a lot of times the loading zone isn't available when their customers are coming in. Times, a lot of times the deliveries are being made um, and it's not right in front of the hotel. It's down the street. The permits that they get right now are limited to certain areas. We had lifted that during um, the pandemic. And um, I think those restrictions went back in place, I want to say last year. Um, and I don't know, I'm, I apologize off the top of my head. I think it's along the seawall primarily that they're not allowed to park. So even if they have the permit and there's an open spot, they can't use it. So if they were purchasing like an entire space, would that be just for loading or would it just be unlimited all day parking? It would be, um, it would be for hotel parking only and they would be able to use that for their deliveries. They would be able to use it for their guests to, to unload their bags or load their bags into their car. Um, it, they would have to, to manage it. Ideally, you wouldn't get a guest parking right in front of their hotel for a three-day weekend and not ever moving. I think that defeats the purpose of it. So they would have to actively manage that okay. to be able to accommodate their guests is what they would like to do. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Do you have any more questions? Okay. I have a couple quick Yeah, go for it. Um, you mentioned uh, the Beach Suites and Capitol Hotel. What about the Venetians? They don't have any of the... They have um, a lot. Oh, they have, they have a lot. They have their own parking. Or they don't buy transferable permits, so they must have enough. Is there? Is, are they the lot that sh shared with the beach suites? No, they're down. I believe when you turn off of Wharf, kind of down into that little parking lot down below. Beach That's Suites has the seven underneath their structure, and then I think they use some oh, of those yeah, that yeah. are up above the Venetian parking. That's right. Okay. I want to say there's like five there. Okay, and you mentioned um, I noticed in the recommendations that the transferable permits for the hotels they could purchase up to ten. And you and it says that uh, you mentioned that the beach suites only uh, have three, but they could purchase up to 10 if they wanted to, or they can only purchase three because they have seven spots. And the reason I ask is because I think Capitola Hotel has 10 rooms, but if I understand correctly, they have two spaces in the mercantile. So wouldn't that mean if there's a limit on how many permits you can get based on how many rooms you have and spaces available? Would it make sense to bring that down to eight or should we bring it up to 10 for beach suites? Does that make sense? It makes sense. And I, I would say that um, you would limit it to the number of rooms because it's intended for the guests, um, not the employees or anybody else. So it, I would limit it to the number of rooms that they have. The number of rooms, period, so, or the number of rooms that they don't already have the parking spaces? The number of rooms that for. they don't have parking Okay. Rooms. So with beach suites, I would okay. say three because they have seven. Capitola Hotel technically doesn't have any. If they get some from the mercantile, then they get eight. Okay. Okay. So we could put it in the wording like up to 10 yes. based on the amount of parking you do or don't have available. Something more eloquent than that. But okay. <laughs> um, cool. And then uh, my last comment is um, about the sensors in the mercantile. 
I, I would be really interested in hearing just in, in the future how much it might cost. I mean, with smart cities being something that is a thing now, I don't know, again, less eloquent uh, way to say that, but, um, you know, perhaps there's grants or something to help us cover the cost of those sensors if it means that, you know, it would lower uh, tailpipe emissions from people driving around in circles if they know that there's not going to be any spaces for them or, you know, something that increases efficiency for us as a city. I would just be interested in finding out how much that would cost, um, even if we can't do it right now, just for for future knowledge. Yeah. That's all. Okay, thank you. That's Lauren Peterson. Any questions? I had one, um, this might be a frivolous question, but I was wondering if we are to request an address change, would we do one for the side of the opening that's on the bay side and then one for Capitola? So it kind of maybe spreads out the traffic a little bit? Put the addresses on that side. Regardless. Completely okay. Get rid of the 426 cap album. Okay. It's confusing for people. They can't find it. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that makes I sense. For bay, I would do the lower lot on Bay Avenue. Okay. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, and then just, uh, this is, sorry, this is more of a comment. However, um, putting a sign out on the Esplanade to deter people from coming down there is not going to do anything. Most people are not looking for parking when they're driving through there. They're using their cell phones to take video. Just my two cents on that. Um, so I can put this out to the public for any comment. Good evening. I'm Bhavna Patel. I am one of the owners of Capitol Hotel. I think my husband is on Zoom and he wants to speak first and then I have a few comments. Great. You do in-person comment? Do you want me to wait? No, you say your, yeah. Is you, your call. He would prefer to speak first, so that's fine. He's been allowed to speak if he can unmute himself. Hello? Hello? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, good evening, council members and mayor. Um, wanted to briefly just go over uh, and just clarify kind of Capitola Hotel's position and 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 uh, our you know parking issues as as we have. Um, I th think it was presented um, pretty well as to some of the issues we're having, but just to kind of dig into that a little bit. Um, uh, you know, again, if if we're going to have a significant increase in in our permit costs, um, you know, we we want to at least have permits that can ha that can be utilized by the guests uh, in some proximity to the hotel. During the pandemic, um, we did open that up along the seawall and Capitola Avenue. Uh, that has now reverted back just recently, um, and uh, you know, given the fact that we almost have very little parking if any in front of our hotel right now because of the construction fencing and everything else um you know i think i think it'd be fair to at least uh, you know uh increase the um you know the, the spots that that uh, the guests could try to utilize with these um uh significantly increased permit uh with the permit pricing so that's one issue. The the other issue is the 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 loading and unloading, and that again, uh, not for parking uh, for overnight guests, but uh, you know for deliveries, for uh, loading and unloading guests and luggage and all that stuff. Um, because as it stands right now, even if a guest were to pull up and the loading zone up the street is available, they would be ticketed if uh, let's say it's a it's a a single guest who isn't sitting in their car while they're checking in and getting their permit so that they can park somewhere else in the village, they would be, they would be ticketed. Um, you know, having a dedicated hotel loading white zone in front of the hotel makes a lot of sense. And it's very consistent with a lot of other, you know, beach villages, similar to Carmel, Carmel. If you look at the hotels that are there that don't have their own onsite parking, have a white zone in front uh, for hotel um, purpose only. Uh, and you'll see that in you know in a lot of metro cities and and, and in other places too. So I think it's very consistent and um, you know alleviates a lot of issues and other traffic headaches um, 
while people are trying to get to their hotel, get their luggage out and, and, and get checked in. So, um, and then uh, I quickly want to touch on uh, the, the matter of like I think somebody mentioned something about uh, the spots uh, and, and possibly reducing down from the ten. We don't own uh, so unlike uh, the Capitalist Suites or whatever, they own those spots. Those are theirs, and it's okay. Hey, that was your three minutes. Your wife is here in person, so I'll turn it over to her. Thank you. Sure, I'll continue on. Um, like I said, my name is Bob Nepatel. Um, so the parking spots, we have zero parking spots as a part of our hotel. The Capitol Beach Suites has seven spots that are underneath their hotel. We actually have the mercantile parking is something that we lease month, like every six months we sign a renewed lease. The fees go up <laughs> and continuous that that's an option that we offer to our guests as a reserved parking because there's no guarantee that they're going to have a spot in the village they might have to use the parking permit that we have from the city in the beach lot well some customers are not okay with that so it's just an added option benefit to ensure the guests feel safe about their car being in a good spot um we basically you know whatever we um we charge the guests for the fee based on what we're paying for them and that's an added spot. So like for the 10 spots, we have 10 hotel rooms. If we have a day where a guest does not want any reserve parking because they don't want to pay for it, we have to have 10 parking permits to allow them to park in the village. Um, it is like, as we had mentioned, it is a huge increase. And we were honestly really shocked about that. But we're willing to work with the city and work with that, assuming that our park, our permits work a lot, what will allow guests to park along the seawall and on Capitola Avenue. We all know it's super complicated. Who wants to go somewhere to a city and stay in a hotel in a village where they're having to go around in circles and try to look for parking spots? And But again, these are the same guests that come spend the money in the city with our businesses and our restaurants and stay a few nights. So we're trying to make the process as convenient for them as, as available. Um, I don't think there was anything else that we wanted to add. Great, thank you so much. Any other public comments for those in person? Good evening, uh, Karin Hanna, lucky enough to be on this committee. And it was a good committee. We had lots of great discussions. Uh, Jim's done a great job. And his, I think his presentation was um, pretty comprehensive. So I just have four quick points. On the signage, we really want it to be consistent. I'd rather not drag the uh, Arts Commission into it because they'll just want to change the look. And what would be the point? This is clear. It's crisp. People have commented really positively on it. It speaks to who Capitola is. It can be used vertically or horizontally. It can be big or small. So I, I and I know like I know Vicki and I have gone around looking at places where the signs can go. We'd be more than happy to work with Public Works or any committee that's looking at increasing where the signage goes. I think the signage is hugely important. They come down there, they see that great sign, they turn, they go up Capitol Avenue, next thing you know, you're, they're in Soquel. They haven't seen another parking sign. They don't know where to go. So um, the banners are really important and uh, and I think the consistency of the look is really important. Um, on the um, one thing about lot the lot full issue, the only other thing that I think is really would really help is if the one way street that's out here that goes to the upper lot was reversed, because the biggest problem is if you come into that upper lot and somebody's in that in one of the aisles waiting for their parking space, you can be trapped in there for five, eight, 10 minutes while somebody waits for a parking place because there's no way out. So it's it's an, it's not because of the size of it, it's very, well, you can't get out. There's only one way out. So if you make this one an, an exit instead of an entrance, first of all, people won't be pulling into there and then immediately finding out that it's full in their trap. So reversing it would really uh, go a long way to taking care of that problem. As long as you can go in and out of a parking lot, if it's full, it's not so frustrating. And what we really wanted to do was try and not keep people circling. So that's why the signage is really important. Uh, the, uh, the parking bank replacement, Santa Cruz 
parking banks, super easy, very user-friendly. Our parking banks, you will never see one person standing at the parking bank. There are always two people. <laughs> yeah. And then they just throw up their hands and leave. And I mean, I have seen people go to the parking bank, get back in their car and drive out of town because they can't figure it out. So hopefully we don't have to wait too long. Nobody has to go around, pour some weird substance into them to make them all fail on the same day so that we can have new ones. I, I, I don't recommend that. And then my last thing is just really, we really, a lot of us on the committee, a hundred percent support the hotel in them having a dedicated parking space. Um, I, I know there the people have gotten tickets in the loading zone while they've been in there and that the parking lots are a little bit scary at night. So I wouldn't, if I were staying here and went to, out to eat and came back at night and had to go to that parking lot for my hotel room, I probably wouldn't come back. So 100% that should be looked at really, really carefully. Great. Thank you. Any other people in the public? All right. Good evening, honorable members of the Capitol City Council. Um, this, uh, uh, first of all, this committee had a unanimous vote on the final recommendations that are going to you. And we spent some good time, Jim did a great job of managing a, a lot of diverse uh, opinions and what we do with this. And uh, this is a small band-aid to a major problem. And the problems, aren't going to go away. You're going to continue to have this kind of kind of issues. And and uh, Morgan, I think your your comment about finding some way to determine how many cars or vacant spots are in the, in the it's an expensive venture that we talked about it, but that that would be a start. Um, our biggest problem is right now is the Esplanade and the backing up on the on the thing. We have no solutions to that right now. Um, the second biggest problem the city is going to have to deal with in the next ten years is is uh, with global warming. We're going to lose East Cliff Drive. I guarantee it. It's starting to happen now. If you go down and look at it from there, you can't stand on the pier and look at it. But you look at that section now where we're getting the rebound off there that took the middle of the pier off. That's at the edge of the road and it's undercutting right now. If that goes, the only way to get across town would be to go along the Union Pacific Corridor. You'd be stuck without a road going through down into the village. It will not be there. It's just a matter of time. Um, there's, there's a, there was a lot of uh, a really interesting uh, discussion about about fee structure. We went up and down a few times, and we 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 didn't want to blow anybody out of the park. But at the same time, that with inflation, to do it, we're we're pretty par to what we see is it's pretty par to what the other jurisdictions are doing, and so we felt that the fees, if the fee base that we're giving you is pretty fair. Um, there's a there's a strong sediment in or sediment in uh, opinion in Capitola that the Esplanade should be cut down to traffic completely in the summertime. You may be faced with that someday. It's been it's being done in a lot of different cities. It wasn't any discussion of that in the in the committee, and uh, we're, we had enough issues to carry to carry through there. What's interesting, if you look around this room, look at the three major pictures. None of them have a car in it. <laughs> this is that maybe their interpretation of how this this community should should be. So um, yes, if, if it ever came to that, what you'd be required to do is put your second story above Pacific Hope, and that's been discussed, and that would put you right at the level with the Union Pacific Corridor. Yeah, but you'd have to then anyone who came into town would would be directed directly to those parking spots. There, you have a shuttle system that brings you in the village. Which, believe me, I'm sorry, there are a few cars. There. Um, <laughs> they're parked, though. They're not moving. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, okay. Okay. Um, that's really all I have to say. But it was a you know, decision of this of this committee. And um, and uh, um, I, I think our recommendations are good for a small step in a big, huge problem we have. Now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Quickly. Yeah. Um, one one concept that we that we started to discuss into, but we didn't get very deeply. That maybe a consideration would be, um, and and this ties into actually another agenda item that you have tonight, and how we resolve parking issues for that are allocated, and with the hotel tonight, 
There is, there's no restaurants in the village that have their own parking. The community pays for the for the parking. They get reimbursed through through tax mm -hmm. But my point, my point is, is that that if you can do an allocation system that works where let's say the hotel can buy into can buy into 10 spaces in in Pacific, in the Pacific Cove parking lot that you have you have tenants that that that, that work from there that that work up to there and and what it does is it makes it more equitable for any any new business right now we if you can talk to planning about this we're stymied we can't allow new businesses to come to this town because you can't provide the parking and you, so you this this town is going to Maybe that's important to people to say exactly Thank you that so you're much. not going to have room. Yes. Okay. And, and have you wrap it up. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else in the public? Anybody there online? Great. Mr. Moore, you've been enabled to speak. Please unmute yourself. Hey, guys. Uh, hope you're having a good night. Uh, so the solution to our problems is robust public transit, but that's obviously a, a long ways off. Uh, I definitely echo, echo the gentleman who just spoke. Uh, closing off the Esplanade is an obvious thing to do during the summer. Uh, when we closed it for the concert for that short period of time, uh, the charity concert, it was wonderful. There were thousands of more people in town as a result. But uh, my real comment tonight is about semiotics. Uh, I love the surfboard sign. It's amazing. It's like very well designed, but it's not what you look for when you're looking for parking. Uh, you wouldn't change a stop sign to a surfboard sign because universal symbology is real. Uh, just using the standard blue parking sign is what's actually going to solve the problem of people not knowing where to go. That's the only real solution to that. And it's also a very inexpensive sign to buy. So I would recommend changing all of the parking signage to just the standard parking sign you see in every other beach town and city and really every jurisdiction in the United States of America, just the blue with the P on it. It's, it's a universal symbol. So thank you and have a great night. Thank you. Oh, okay. So I can take this back to uh, council deliberation. Do we have any council comments? I have a couple more questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, I know when we did the outdoor dining program, we needed to send that to the Coastal Commission because we were taking away parking spaces and they considered that coastal access, et cetera, et cetera. What would the process look like if we were to consider securing a space for loading and unloading for Capitola Hotel, seeing as though that's not an outdoor dining space, but we would be securing it or essentially taking it away from public use? Would we need to create a whole plan and send that to the Coastal Commission to get them to approve? What does that look like? Because I know we can't just give them a space and say this is yours now. So what does that look like? So I don't know exactly. I'll preface my answer with that. Um, I do recall that years ago we set up a uh, the allowance, the coastal com an allowance from the coastal commission to have a valet parking program, and in it, actually written into our LCP, allows us to dedicate up to two spaces for valet parking that basically let people park down there and then folks to move the cars up the upper or lower lot. So I do suspect there would be a process, but we would have to work it out with coastal commission on exactly how we would do that. So what would that look like here then? Would we need that to come back to us as a new a new agenda item where we agree that we want to do that or would we agree to do that tonight? And then you would go talk to Coastal Commission. My recommendation is, is that tonight you make a you take action on the, the recommendations from the subcommittee, which is basically, you know, the changes in the rates, tell us what you want to do with the signs, tell us what you want to do with the permits. You could also tell us to research this issue about loading in front of the hotel as well. And then what we would do is come back with an actual ordinance and then the documents that we would need to su submit to Coastal Commission to make it happen. So there's no real final action we could take tonight, but if you guys signal that that's the direction you want to go, we'll come back with the actual path to get there. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, for the sake of just discussion amongst council members, I, I would be in favor of moving forward with the recommendations of the committee, but asking that staff 
research that issue about the loading and unloading space um, for the Coastal Commission. I like the idea um, of the surfboard signs. You know, we're not every other coastal town, I think, gives us some character to have that sign out there. And I'd like to see that, um, you know, consistently if we're going to have it down in the village and other lots like the committee recommended. I like the idea of changing the address to the entrance of the parking lots, working with the mapping apps, moving the pen for it. Uh, the lot changes, the you know notice that says all day parking and the banners over the entrance, all that. I think this all um, looks good. Um, yeah, I think I thought I had more notes, but I think that's all I have to say for now. Um, but for again, for the sake of discussion with my fellow council members, I would um, personally like to see uh, staff look into what it would take for us to Oh, yeah, for us to uh, get that dedicated spot for loading and unloading. But then also, um, I would hope that we would expect that they would be paying the same space rent as any of the um, outdoor dining folks are, since that space is now no longer going to be available to the public. So those are my comments right now. I agree with that. And added to that, I would, I would like to see them have the opportunity to park anywhere because we all know can't have just certain areas for them to park because most of the time you just get lucky and find a place to park. So if we could add that to it, uh, if we're going to increase their price to over $300, it would be nice if they could just find a place to park. I would push back on that a little bit, um, at least for the parking that's right in front of the ocean. Those 15, what is it, spots from the left of Zelda's to the where the sea lion is. Um, only because the folks that are going to be parking there will probably park and then leave for several days. And with Coastal Commission, at least, we know that they want to have accessibility for for people for visitors and for folks coming from our community. And so parking there and leaving their car for three days takes that away. Think of our surfers who come and want to score an early spot. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't think it's a good idea to have it against that seawall. Um, they this, the owner said maybe Capitola Ave, those other areas. I don't know what the limitations are. I didn't see it in the, so when we got the staff report, I would just add to know where the limitations were. We could maybe take it one more step where they, people coming to the hotel, if they decide they're going to come and park their car for three days, park in the other lots, pay less money. But if, if somebody's coming to the hotel and they're visiting Capitola, they should have the same opportunity to park oceanfront. But I do agree with you. You don't want them to come there and, and be there for three days or, or two days. But or, uh, something maybe the hotel could work out with it, their it's a lot of oversight. I'm not sure. It but, is. Or would it be more of a seasonal thing where I don't know that Coastal Commission would allow us to. I, I, I What I about there? What about for right now, though, while the construction fencing is up? Because we did we did allow them to park on an ocean front during the pandemic, and then that lapsed. But to their point, now that there's construction fencing up, they've lost a lot of spaces. So I mean, I I would be in favor of allowing it at least while the construction fencing is up, and then when that comes down, putting that limitation back. But yes, I think it would. I think I don't know how we would enforce it, but I agree that we don't want someone who is going to stay four nights at the hotel to go park in front of the in front of the beach and not move their car for four days. Right. Although being someone to come into a, a beautiful hotel and a beautiful beach and not be able to park somewhere and spending all that money is yeah. you know, the best thing. But, yeah, I, but I agree. I agree. We don't want them to park. But if it's only days. limited to, what, 15 spots that they're unable to park in, it's, it, if we can increase it to the Capitol Avenue spots, at least give a little bit more to them, that might be a little bit more wiggle room for the guests. So, so I'll I'll continue on um, with comments and then hear from the rest of council. I I I agree. I think the thank you to the committee for spending all the time talking about rates and all of that sort of stuff. I did have a follow up question when I was on FAC. We talked about a program for locals during like off season, similar to what the Santa Cruz Wharf does. So I'd be interested in you just coming back when we get the next report about if that was it. Because I don't want to go on and on about that, but. Um, that would have been something that I think when it was actually Kristen was the mayor and I was vice mayor, we talked about that really cool program, especially for our locals. Um, so that um, with the revenue that we're increased, we're estimated to see about $161,000 um, according to your staff report. And so we know that the meters are no good. You know, they're not beloved. 
So if we can get some information, maybe not at this next report, but how much that revenue increase would allow us, you know, how much would it be to over to get newer meters as a whole package and how much that would take us to, to solving that problem? Because our speaker, Karen, was correct. People do come and go and eat the $50 ticket, you know. Um, the in regards to the hotel, I mean, that's a huge increase. That's pretty significant. And I'm happy to hear that there's support from the one hotel. I'm curious to know what the other owner has to say about that um, before moving on. It sounds like there's a lot of um, options for our, our two business owners to explore. And I'd like to hear more about what they would be willing to settle on. If we do the unloading and loading, you know, that would be unloading, loading, not close to the Capitola Hotel. It sounds like there's no space. It'd be a little bit further down and whether that would work for them or not, even in reality. And with that cost plus another 3,400 a year for 10 parking spots, that seems like a $7,000 a year. I think the spot would be right in front of their door. There would be one right in front of the door, um, but it wouldn't be specific to them. So is that really something? Well, it would be. It would be. That's would the point. The, it would be their would the specific spot. Yeah. Like our, okay. Um, so I'd like to know if that's something they would choose rather than the 10 parking spots. I feel like it needs to be one or the other, um, or if they're willing to pay for it all, just getting their input on that would be really helpful in making my decision. Um, one way or another. So um, I like just to see more information come back. And then in regards to the other hotel. I have a couple of comments as well. Um, I think moving forward, if um, what we've talked about is possibly replacing some of our pay stations, um, I know there are some that sort of have some weatherproofing, some sort of overhang, some you know resistance to the elements. I think that is something that we really need to consider. Um, also, uh, I know that our parking enforcement has a really tough job, but if we could maybe be in a little bit more of a, of a uh, team-based attitude when it comes to the loading and unloading and not ticketing people that are coming to stay at the hotels, um, I don't know if that takes an extra step into the lobby of Capitol Hotel and just saying, hey, is this car with you guys? Okay, they've got like 10, 15 more minutes before I got to come back around, whatever that may be. Um, just get a little bit more communication going between both sides. I think that that would be really helpful moving forward. Um, so I think what I'm hearing is we need a little bit more information on the hotel yeah, parking. I like that idea. I like the temporary tag idea too, of just like, can they park there without getting a ticket, you know, when they unload mm -hmm. if that that's another option, maybe like a 10 minute don't ticket me mm -hmm. thing. Um, I'm sorry. I did have one more about the signs. Uh, I'm pushing, I'm pushing when you exit Bay, Bay and Porter right off, like your path before you're going to see Knob Hill on the right. There's no signs. So if we can extend the signs all the way over there, not just Monterey and, and Park, Park mm -hmm. like that freeway exit, that would be really neat. So I, cause I think about what Santa Cruz does for like the boardwalk, they partnered with the, with the um, private owners of the um, uh, businesses over there that they allow signage to go up on their property. Mm -hmm. And so during summer, when they get off highway 17, all the way right from that first light, they're able to see signage for parking. And I think that'd be great to kick it all the way back like that for us. So, sorry, I'm not excited about the signs. Yeah, that's right. And they're cute. Signs like are them. good, yeah. Okay. I have something. Yes. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, I think parking committee did a really good job. Um, a lot of really good ideas there. I was curious um, when you say, allow additional accommodations for availability of parking spaces, uh, referring to Capitol Hotel. Did the parking committee look into, do you have any recommendations on specific spaces? Um, they just, the committee's recommendation is to evaluate the and, and potentially modify those. <laughs> um, <laughs> and modify those. So and it, was, it was the seawall and Cap Ave, um, but they didn't say specifically allow cap ab and not the seawall. Okay, so that's your 
basically asking us to give you a direction to explore. Yeah, and I, I would um, I would suggest we incorporate the parking enforcement officers into that conversation because they're the ones out out there actually having to enforce these rules, and it doesn't it's not helpful if we make up rules that are <laughs> <laughs> hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> That's all. Okay. okay, so do we want to I'll try. Make, yeah, with your sort of enhancements that we have. Yeah. So do we have a slide? Do you want to dare try to pull up the slide with staff recommendation? Or I can just pull it up up here. Um then in the summary. Thank you. I have the summary in front of me and it's pretty extensive. So realistically, the direction we need is, is, is to go back and prepare documentation necessary to adopt uh, in a coming meeting. And I think we've gotten the feedback we need. It sounds like there's still some unsettled question about the hotel, um, but we'll bring back information about the hotel and what some options might look like to deal with that okay. when we do this. Okay. So I don't, so we don't necessarily need a motion then. If the council is comfortable with what's been said, mm -hmm. and sort of the gist of the conversation, I think we're good. If somebody wants to try to I, encapsulate into a single motion, okay. but I think I we think it's all on the table as far as what we're comfortable with. And what we're hearing is is that the recommendations on rates in the Parking and Traffic Commission are good. The sign recommendations are good, but we really should look at going all the way to Bay Porter, uh, and then come back with some conversations about. Uh, Costs for new pay stations and what does the hotel might want? What would that exactly look like? And then we'll bring back some options about maybe making some additional changes around their parking. Smart city. And, then and reaching smart out city parking to the sensors. Coastal Commission, right? Yeah. And yes, the, the smart lot sensors. And both hotels. Both hotels yes. can be part of. Okay. No biggie, right? Okay. We got and it. And right. hold it's on. Okay. And no, no more. <laughs> Thank you. That's enough, right? <laughs> you got it all? Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jim. And to the parking committee, we really appreciate yeah. it. And we'll go on to item 8B. This is the Coastal Rail Trail segments 10 and 11. The recommended action tonight is to receive the report on the Coastal Rail Trail. Segments 10 and 11. This is the project through the city of Capitola. And I have Ms. Khan here. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce you to county and RTC staff that are working on segments 10 and 11 of the rail trail through the city of Capitola. On Zoom, we have the project manager from the county of uh, Santa Cruz, Rod Kidmore. And in the uh, chambers today, we have senior planner Grace Blake. Lakesley and Executive Director Guy Preston from the SCC RTC, and I will let them take the lead on the presentation this evening. Thank you. And good evening. We did have a presentation. If you're able to pull that up for us, oh, thank you so much. I'm Grace Blakesley. Thank you, Jessica, for the nice introduction. I'm a transportation planner with the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. We have Rob Tidmore online with us, who is the project manager for this segments 10 and 11, and Guy Preston, our executive director. And we really appreciate your time tonight um, to receive information about the Coastal Rail Trail project developments. It was nice to follow the three CEs. They are helping us with development of electric um, vehicle charging stations uh, as part of our Davenport parking lot, which is being developed as part of our North Coast Rail Trail. It was great to hear a report from them. Um, I'll provide a really brief overview of the Coastal Rail Trail development, then hand it over to Rob to talk about the Coastal Rail Trail segment eight and nine in detail, and then over to Guy Preston to make a few comments about RTC's work on rail transit and to talk a little bit about the Capitola Trestle. It was great to see Dennis Norton here earlier today. He was essential, um, really pivotal part of developing the Coastal Rail Trail project some time ago. So thanks, De Dennis, if you're still here for your support. The Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network, go ahead, next slide, is a two-county pedestrian and bicycle project uh, designed to foster appreciation of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Development of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail in Santa Cruz County specifically is a directed effort by the Santa Cruz County Transportation Commission. In November 2013, 10 years ago almost, the RTC adopted the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Master Plan. Uh, 
The master plan identifies activities, um, identifies an active transportation corridor along the Santa Cruz branch rail line referred to as the coastal rail trail. And this coastal rail trail serves as the spine of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. The coastal rail trail connects to many, many spur trails along our coast to make up a network of coastal access. The master plan for the trail was developed over a three-year period with extensive public input and culminated in its adoption in 2013 by RTC and then by adoptions by all local jurisdictions through which it travels, including the city of Capitola in 2014. Next slide. Um, thank you. The Coastal Rail Trail's development is supported in part by the passage of 2016 Measure D half cent sales tax, of which 17% of the revenues go to development of the Coastal Rail Trail. This funding has been critical in advancing the pre-construction activities associated with the Coastal Rail Trail, which makes the project more competitive for state and local funds, and also serve as a grant match to leverage state and local funds. Next slide. As you can see in this slide, segments of the Coastal Rail Trail are in various stages of development and some stages are completed and open to the public. I'll briefly review the status of the trail development. Segment five is in the northern portion of the county and extends from Davenport to Wilder Ranch State Park. It's nearing final design and is fully funded for construction. Segment seven, phase one, shown in green, is extends from Natural Bridges Drive to Bay in California intersection in the city of Santa Cruz and is completed and open to the public. Segment seven, phase two, which extends from the end of segment seven, phase one at Bay and California intersection um, extends to the roundabout in front of the city of Santa Cruz Wharf and that is under construction. Uh, the small green dot that you'll see uh, kind of near the center of this slide is the um, portion of the coastal rail trail that's uh, cantilevered to the San Lorenzo River Bridge and provides access across the San Lorenzo River between the boardwalk and the east side of the city of Santa Cruz. Segments eight and nine just south, southeast of there um, begin in the city of Santa Cruz at near the city of Santa Cruz Wharf and extend to 17th Avenue in the county of Santa Cruz. This segment just finished its environmental faves and is moving into file design and is also fully funded for construction. Uh, you'll hear more about segment 10 and 11 later, so I'll go ahead and skip over that. But just southeast of segment 11 is segment 12, which is currently in the environmental phase. I was recently awarded federal funding and is seeking additional funding, um, state funding for construction. Um, heading down uh, to the southern part of our county, segment 18, phase one from Walker to Lee Road in the city of Capitola is completed. The remaining segments shown um, in a lighter pink uh, southeast of segment 12 down to Pajaro, we call those segments 13 through 20. Um, with the exception of that section in segment 18, um, these remaining sections are being advanced as part of our zero emission rail transit project, which Guy Preston will speak to towards the end of our presentation. And with that, I'll hand it over to Rob. Thank you so much. Thank you, Grace. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Great. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, as Grace mentioned, my name is Rob Tidmore. Uh, I work for the County of Santa Cruz, and I'm the project manager for Coastal Rail Trail segments 10 and 11. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight to share an update on the design of this project uh, through the Capitola city limits. The County of Santa Cruz is the lead agency for segments 10 and 11. And I'm really excited to share, uh, as you probably know, that the county received a competitive ATP grant of $67.6 .6 million from the state's active transportation program, uh, which fully funds the project. So we are the sort of the 18th mile of uh, the sort of fully funded or completed portion of the coastal rail trail that Grace uh, mentioned starting up in Davenport. So it's, it's a very exciting time to be working on um, these various rail trail uh, projects. Um, as far as 1011 is concerned, the project team um, has been working very closely with RTC and your staff over the past 18 months to develop the design and the environmental documents. A preliminary design for this portion of the project is almost complete or roughly 20% design and we are about to start the technical studies that will inform uh, the project EIR. So this is a map uh, showing segment 10 in green, which starts at 17th Avenue and goes to 47th Avenue. 
The Capitoli city limits are overlaid on the map for your reference. Those are shown in dark gray. Uh, segment 11, shown in purple, starts at uh, 47th Avenue, continues through the village. Um, next slide. And then passes, uh, goes along Park Avenue, and then passes through uh, New Brighton State Beach before ending at State Park Drive. All told, these two segments of the Coastal Rail Trail are 4.7 miles long. Uh, next slide, please. So the project is pursuing a phased approach to trail development. Uh, and when I say phased approach, I mean, um, basically there are two different ways in which the rail corridor could be developed with the trail. The first uh, is what you see on the screen in front of you, is to build the trail next to the rail line, which we're calling the ultimate trail configuration. This is consistent with the MBSST master plan that Grace mentioned previously, and is the proposed project for the purposes of the EIR for this project. This will also be the focus of my design presentation tonight since um, the aforementioned grant funding that the county received was for the ultimate trail configuration. So with this configuration, the existing rail line is preserved. The trail is built next to the tracks, maintaining the required offset distance from center line of tracks. The trail is generally 12 feet wide, but is reduced in some areas due to constraints and widened in other areas where there's room. Fencing is required on the side of the trail next to the rail line and also on the far side of the trail on the right side of your screen where uh, grade changes such as retaining walls or drop-offs make it necessary for safety like you can, like you you can see on the image in front of you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for the ultimate trail, um, the ultimate trail uh, configuration is 4.2 miles long. It's a multi-use bicycle and pedestrian trail. As I mentioned, 12 feet wide. There are a new bicycle and pedestrian bridges proposed as uh, part of the project. And the half mile section across Soquel Creek is part of a later project phase. And I'll get into more detail about that. And I already mentioned the fence between the trail and the tracks. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the second way in which the corridor could be developed is to implement an optional first phase where the existing railroad tracks are removed and an interim trail is built on the rail line. This approach would require rail banking of the corridor in order to be able to remove the railroad tracks. And under this scenario, the trail is generally 16 feet wide, but is reduced to 12 feet in several areas due to constraints. Fencing is not required with this option, except where grade changes make it necessary for safety. If the rail line were rail banked, oh, sorry, yes, continue on the slide, please. And then later reactivated, the optional first phase would be followed by a second future phase where the interim trail was removed, railroad tracks are rebuilt, and a new trail is built next to the rail line in the ultimate trail configuration. I will not be going into detail on the interim trail design during this presentation, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have uh, at the end. Uh, next slide, please. So again, uh, because this, this piece includes the Capitola trestle, this section is 4.7 miles long. Um, the trail is constructed in place of the existing railroad tracks, 16 feet wide, as I mentioned. And rather than building new bicycle pedestrian bridges under, in the ultra, interim trail scenario, we would be converting the existing rail bridges to bicycle pedestrian bridges. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the major uh, project milestones. Some of these have already occurred. Um, I'll start with the notice of preparation of an EIR, which occurred in October of 2021. We uh, went through a series of draft schematic plan reviews in 2022, both with the public and with uh, other agencies, and I'll get into that on in the next slide. And the, the draft environment, environmental impact report for the project is expected to be released um, to the public in October of 2023. And we expect to have the final environmental impact report certified in February or March of next year. Uh, final design is scheduled to start in 2024 and uh, will be complete by 2026. And then we're targeting a construction start date of 2026. And we expect construction to last roughly two years. Uh, next slide, please. So we've had uh, a, a wide array of uh, public input and public meetings over the last uh, almost two years. These are some of the key. Um, meetings that we've held. I mentioned the uh, environmental impact report scoping meeting in November of 21. We held some uh, neighborhood presentations in late 2021. We presented to the RTC transportation policy workshop in February 22. And then we held a series of virtual and in-person open house uh, schematic design reviews in spring 2022. We also had an online project survey uh, around that same time. And we um, presented to a, a series of um, 
RTC uh, citizen advisory committees, the bicycle committee, the elderly and disabled transportation advisory committee, the interagency technical advisory committee, and that all happened in the spring of 2022, presented to the county parks and recreation committee commission in the summer of 2022. And then we had some recent neighborhood presentations this past spring. So um, very important project, also a lot of public outreach occurring to date. And of course, we're here uh, in front of you tonight uh, for, for more of that. Um, next slide, please. So now I'm gonna get into uh, more of the design. I'll start with segments 10. Um, and uh, speaking of, uh, when we refer to segment 10, the, the trail is on the inland side of the tracks um, from basically 17th Avenue to 47th Avenue, and then switches to the coastal side uh, at 47th Avenue, Avenue at the end of segment 10. Because of the narrow right-of-way and um, the, the location of the tracks roughly in the middle of the right-of-way, we are relocating the railroad tracks from 17th to just past 47th Avenue to make uh, sufficient space to build a trail next to them. And there are some retaining walls in this portion of segment 10 to hold up existing slopes. <laughs> The trail in this in this portion is 11 to 14 feet wide uh, and does does narrow to 10 feet wide at intersections and at bridges. And I'm going to focus on three key areas tonight. The 41st Avenue intersection, what happens at Jade Street Park, and then the Cliff Drive parking lot and plaza. So next slide, please. These are two views of the 41st Avenue railroad crossing looking east along the tracks. The image on the left is existing and the image on the right is with the proposed trail and relocated track. As you can see on the screen in front of you, bull belts, uh, also known as expanded sidewalks, have been added on both sides of 41st Avenue to essentially widen the sidewalk, which shortens the crossing distance and improves the visibility of trail users because this is such a, a high volume street. Uh, we wanted to be extra mindful of, of safety here. Uh, you'll also notice that the trail jogs on the west side of 41st Avenue and crosses at a slight angle. And that is to clear uh, the railroad crossing arms, which are set at the minimum distance from the rail line. As with all the crossings on this project, green cross bike pavement markings, markings and LED lit uh, pedestrian crossing signs will be added to improve safety and in, in inform drivers of uh, pedestrians crossing. Next slide, please. And this is uh, just a slide from the latest uh, design drawings showing the same intersection. And there you can see the bulb outs and expanded sidewalks on either side of 41st Avenue. Next slide, please. Okay, here we are at the Jade Street Park area. Um, again, uh, existing on the left, uh, proposed on the right. We are now looking west um, towards uh, an incorporated part of the county. There, um, in this area, there is no fencing on the park side uh, of the trail. And the reason for that is to improve, uh, provide maximum permeability between the trail and the park. Uh, all the existing redwood trees that you see on the screen will be retained. Those are all outside of the RTC right of way. And then as you can see on the, the very bottom of the screen, the trail switches from the inland side to the coastal side there. And on the southeast corner of 47th and Portola, we've added a bulb out to that corner, which is basically a, um, a way to reduce the radius um, for cars turning so they can't make uh, as high speed of turns. So that, that will improve trail user safety as well as improve just general pedestrian safety in that area. Um, and just as a note, this image incorrectly omits the green cross bike pavement markers. Um, those will be uh, part of the improvements as well. Uh, next slide, please. So there you can see those uh, green cross bike markings that are part of um, the trail. So trail users basically will cross uh, 47th Avenue north of the tracks, then cross the tracks using the sidewalk, and then continue on the trail um, on, the, on the coastal side of the, the tracks uh, from 47th Avenue moving east. Uh, next slide, please. So moving slightly farther east, these are two views of the Cliff Drive parking lot looking west. The view on the right is proposed. The trail uh, is now on the coastal side of the tracks, which takes advantage of the wider RTC right-of-way in this area, and which also serves to maximize ocean views. The existing on-street diagonal parking lot, which you can see on the left screen, um, which is partially on RTC property, has been reconfigured to parallel parking in the image on your right. And that is um, needed in order to fit the trail next to the tracks and retain the existing on-street bicycle lane, which is important, especially um, due to the uh, uphill nature of this area where, where bicyclists will be traveling slowly going uphill. Uh, the original parking lot design for this area, which you see on the screen in front of you, included 23 spaces, which is a reduction of 23 spaces from the existing 46. Um, next slide, please. 
uh, but the latest design expands that parking area southwest along Cliff Drive, and there are now 34 spaces proposed. And that was uh, in conjunction with uh, your staff trying to maximize parking in this area. So also, you can see on the screen in front of you, at the end of the parking lot, uh, so that would be the sort of uh, towards Capitola Village, uh, a trail plaza is proposed within the RTC right-of-way that will have seating, bike racks, and potentially space for public art. The project also includes a formalized rail crossing at the, um, the right side of the screen and an improved and widened concrete staircase up the hill that leads to Prospect Avenue. Can move the, the thing? We can't see what he's talking about. So if you can this zoom the up. Faces, oh, the, the pictures of the speakers, can you move Sorry, that Rob. I just oh, can't. no problem. Definitely want you to be able to see what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Oh, Sorry. That's better. Thank you. Sorry, you go ahead, Rob. Okay. All right. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so uh, that staircase that I mentioned connects to Prospect Avenue and Opal Street. Um, and the, the new formal crossing is subject to CPUC approval. That's the California Public Utilities Commission. They, um, they help regulate uh, railroads. But um, we think this uh, formal crossing has a good chance of being approved due to the well-documented uh, historic use. As, as you all know, there's um, you know, a lot of people are coming up and down that staircase uh, every day and, and going to the beach. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that that, that formal crossing will be, will be approved by the CPUC. Um, and um, as part of the application, we would propose closing the other existing uh, crossing that you see just to the left of the, the new staircase there. It's sort of a dog leg hillside trail connection that, that goes from Prospect Ave down to the parking lot as well. And th that would be um, done to help our case to allow for this new formal rail crossing. Um, and then finally, the drawing also shows where the trail ends, uh, again, on the right side of the screen and connects to the existing crosswalk uh, across uh, Cliff Drive. So next slide, please. So this is an aerial showing the Capitola Village area. So from the trail end at Cliff Drive, trail users will be directed to use existing surface streets, bike lanes, and sidewalks through Capitola Village and then up to Monterey and Park Avenue intersection where the trail restarts. And as part of this project, we're proposing to install Coastal Rail Trail branded wayfinding signage through the village to help trail users uh, navigate uh, this section. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned previously, the ultimate trail configuration ends on either side of the Capitola trestle and the trestle is excluded from the ultimate trail configuration. Due to the timber timber trestle design of a portion of the structure and the limited right of way, the RTC determined that it is not feasible to cantilever a trail bridge from the trestle, like was done at the San Lorenzo River mouth, nor to build a standalone trail bridge. So um, conversely, the, trail, the trestle is included in the interim trail configuration as a conversion of the train bridge to a bicycle pedestrian bridge. This would require additional structural repairs on the trestle and uh, a new rail and trail bridge is included in the RTC's zero emission rail transit project. And, and Guy will talk about both of these things in more detail after my presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, moving on to the continuation of segment 11. So we're, we're starting here uh, at, at Monterey and Park Avenue. And the trail in this section is on the coastal side of the tracks from here until Mar Vista, and then switches from the coastal to the inland, inland side from Mar Vista to State Park Drive. Um, throughout this portion of segment 11, the trail is 12 feet wide, but then narrows to 10 feet wide at intersections and at trail bridges. Several viaducts and a new trail bridge at the New Brighton Access Road overcrossing are proposed. There are also retaining walls uh, throughout this, this portion of the project to deal with the steep slopes. And today I'm gonna to focus on three key areas, the, the portion from Monterey to Grove, uh, several viaducts at Escalona Gulch and then at Park Avenue, and then a new proposed Coronado Street ramp. Uh, so next slide, please. So the trail starts again uh, here at Monterey Avenue, Park Avenue, uh, again, on the coastal side of the tracks. And the city of Capitola's parking lot trail project will improve the intersection uh, going across Monterey Avenue. Um, so there'll be a, a new cross bike added as part of that project, which is why it's not shown here. And that, that project will also provide an additional connection to the rail trail. So trail users uh, in this portion of the, the project who are heading west or towards downtown or to Capitola Village will uh, get to the end of the trail here, cross the tracks on the east side of Monterey, and then cross Monterey at the crosswalk, and then continue down Monterey Avenue. 
to the moon. So a bit of a, a you know, a, a funky maneuver here, but that's what's required to get around uh, the tracks and, and to cross, cross safely at this intersection with the intersection being so close to the existing tracks. Uh, next slide, please. So from Monterey Avenue to Grove Lane, um, this is um, this is one of the more challenging uh, portions of the project due to the steep topography and the abundant trees uh, through this, this portion of the, the rail line. And uh, because of this, we explored three different options in conjunction with the city of Capitola staff to determine which alignment had the least environmental impacts. We looked at the trail on the inland side of the tracks, the trail on the coastal side of the tracks, and we also looked at you know, what would happen if you put a trail along Park Avenue. And um, based on our design analysis, it, 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 it just so happens that the trail on the coastal side of the tracks uh, requires the least number of tree removals and has the least impacts. However, as you can see on the screen in front of you, the steep topography uh, still necess necessitates the use of retaining walls to hold up the slope. So the original design shown on the left utilized a single tall retaining wall, and the latest designs shown conceptually on the right utilize two smaller walls to raise the trail above railroad grade, which reduces costs and avoids the need for underground anchors below adjacent private properties, and just generally makes the, the walls less imposing to trail users. And um, uh, next slide, please. So here's the latest, uh, again, latest design drawings showing on the bottom of the screen two representative cross sections of those um, existing slopes and the retaining walls that would be used to hold up those slopes. Next slide, please. So moving east along Park Avenue, the trail crosses the riparian area known as Escalona Gulch. Here, the rail line is on a steep embankment as depicted on the image on the left. And because of the steep embankment, it is very challenging to build retaining walls against the embankment to hold up the trail. So instead, we're proposing a viaduct, which is essentially a lightweight deck system supported by drilled concrete piers spaced roughly 30 feet apart. Uh, conceptual images of the viaduct system are shown on both sides of the screen where you can see uh, those piers drilled down into the embankment and then the, the lightweight deck uh, floating on top. Um, the image on the right is from segment nine uh, in the city of Santa Cruz's jurisdiction and that shows one of the proposed viaducts for, uh, for that portion of the project. And then th just as a note, this same system will be needed uh, farther east along Park Avenue uh, due to the steep topography above the New Brighton State Beach parking lot. Next slide, please. Um, this is um, one of the parts of the project that I'm more excited about just because of the, the high use of this area and, and the ability of this project to, to improve the existing conditions here. So at the, at the Park Avenue and Coronado Street intersection, um, the project is proposing to add an ADA accessible trail connection across the tracks, which will take place of the existing dirt goat trail that leads down from you know, Park Avenue down to New Brighton State Beach. And this will entail utilizing a viaduct system to ramp down from uh, the existing Park Avenue crosswalk, which brings people down to trail grade. From there, they can access the rail trail in either direction. And again, like the Cliff Drive uh, portion of the project, this new rail crossing will be subject to CPUC approval. Um, but like the other one, there's a very strong history of documented use in this area. And we think the CPUC is likely to approve this crossing. Uh, and we're also working with state parks in this area to improve the highly popular and very eroded informal trail that runs down all the way to uh, the New Brighton parking lot. And we'll be replacing that with a concrete staircase that so that people can get more easily from the trail in the neighborhood down to the beach. Um, so this is my last slide and concludes my presentation. And I'll hand the microphone off to Guy to discuss the RTC zero emission rail project. And I'll be available to answer any questions after the presentation. Thank, thank you, you Robin. Thank you, um, Mayor Brooks and uh, Captain. Oh, Mayor Kaiser. oh, that's right. We've changed now. It's all Mayor good. Kaiser yeah. and uh, fellow city council members. I'm Guy Preston. I'm um, RTC's executive director, and I would be remiss to um, not talk about the rail line at all. Um, we focused um, tonight's presentation primarily on the trail, um, so I'll keep it um, relatively brief. Um, we are proceeding with a project for zero emission uh, passenger rail on the rail line. Um, the rail line um, extends from Pajaro Junction all the way up to Davenport, but the passenger rail section would only extend from Pajaro Junction to Natural Bridges in Santa Cruz. Um, zero emission passenger rail was identified in a previous study, our transit corridor alternatives analysis. 
as the uh, locally preferred alternative and the best use of the rail line for moving uh, people um, via transit. Uh, next slide, please. So the passenger rail project um, is um, a significant project to uh, convert a old uh, single track uh, freight railroad um, to passenger rail. Uh, to do so, we're going to need passing sidings because the existing uh, rail line is a single track. Um, we anticipate um, approximately three sidings would be needed on the 22 mile branch line. We would also need um, stations um, and uh, operations and maintenance facility, storage facilities. Um, we'd have to um, consider replacement and rehabilitation of major infrastructure such as bridges. There's uh, dozens of bridges in this 22 mile section. Uh, we have um, uh, over 100 rail crossings um, on the entire line. So there's, I think, about 80 in this section. Uh, we'd have to consider signaling on this section um, and, and how to make sure that uh, the, the railroad would be safe. Um, to uh, meet our performance measures, we'd have to consider the alignment of the rail line. Uh, the rail line was designed for slow speed freight rail. So we'd have to consider um, curve corrections um, and, um, uh, you know, how we can make our travel times um, for a modern rail system. Um, and then uh, ultimately, we would want to connect at uh, Harlow Station to the state rail system. Um, and there's significant development to bring um, more passenger rail down uh, all the way to Salinas, um, including a new passenger rail station at Harlow Junction. Next slide. So, um, when Grace did gave her presentation, she showed a big section in light pink that uh, was currently not um, advanced um, um, in depth. And that includes uh, from Rio del Mar to Paro Junction, segments 13 through 20, and also the Capitola Trestle. So we wanted to figure out how we could make sure we could um, address those sections as well as coordination with the existing trail projects because if we're going to be adjusting the alignment of the rail line, we don't want to impact what's going on with the projects like, like Rob just explained. And those would be segments 7 through 12. So next slide. So the Capitola Trestle and SoCal over, you know, and the crossing over SoCal Creek is uh, fairly significant and I know it's important to the city of Capitola. Um, it's important to the Regional Transportation Commission as well. Um, a few things that we've learned about the trestle is that the existing structure cannot accommodate um, both rail and trail. Um, there's no way to cantilever off and attach a trail to the existing bridge. There's also not enough room the way it was constructed in the center of our right-of-way with a kind of um, tapered um, structure, the, the timber trestle to actually build an independent structure adjacent to the existing trestle. So uh, the only alternative if to, to actually um, have rail and trail would be to replace the existing Capitola trestle with a combined trestle bridge um, that rail and trail could uh, traverse across. Next slide, please. So that's what we're moving forward with. Uh, we've procured a consultant to prepare a concept report and an environmental impact report for rail and trail. This would be passenger rail from Pajaro Junction to um, natural bridges and the remaining sections of the trail. The concept report is uh, expected to start this summer and take about two years. And then we it would take about another two years to complete the environmental impact report. And then during this, um, these first two years, there'll be plenty of opportunities for public input, including um, uh, input from Capitola City Council for um, helping us develop the project purpose and need, um, service-based assumptions, where the stations are gonna go, how, what speeds are going to be expected, um, what travel times we would um, anticipate between Watsonville and Santa Cruz, all those things affect the locations of your passing sidings, how many stations you can have, and um, how many uh, riders would actually use the system. Um, we will work on the refined alignment, um, what major infrastructure is going to need to be replaced, and of course, uh, I mentioned earlier, the station concepts. 
And um, once we're done with that, we'll have a draft concept report and an, another opportunity for the um, public to comment before we start um, and issue a notice of preparation for the environmental impact report. And that two year period will have another opportunity for public input. So that concludes our um, presentation today. Um, that is our contact information, and I'm sure you probably have some great questions that we're here to answer. Thank you so much. A couple more staff slides. After oh, slide. yeah. So you want to go ahead? If I may. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Oh, 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 my oh your slide. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had it stuff for you. Oh. <laughs> Um, so to speak a bit to the information included in the staff report, uh, city staff has been coordinating with both county and RTC staff about village circulations enhancements in uh, the village um, as a separate project from the Coastal Rail Trail segments 10 and 11. The segments 10 and 11 project, as Rob mentioned, does have signage to connect um, users from one end of the trail to the other, but this would be improvements uh, potentially to pedestrian and bicycles throughout our village. Um, it's not eligible for funding through the current segment 10 and 11 project with the county, but it is eligible for measure D funding and most um, usually utilizes matching funds. Um, so I will say that this has not been scoped out. That would be through a public planning process that would be rather extensive considering the amount of users in the village and uh, interested parties. Potential enhancements include additional and expanded sidewalks, uh, enhanced bike facilities and new striping and signage. Uh, with RTC staff, city staff has devised or a proposed funding and schedule to do these type of enhancements throughout the village, which will consist of applying for grant funding for both planning and construction. Uh, a timeline, this is the same timeline that was provided in your staff report, and it consists of applying for design grants with the with Caltrans doing the ATP or active transportation plan, and then applying again for state funds to do construction, assuming that we can use UIPD for a match. Uh, so with that, that is the end end of all of the slides. And myself, Kennedy staff, and RTC staff are all available for questions. Thank you so much. I'll take it to council for questions. What? Okay. Hey, I don't have any either. Um, are, is there any public comment on this item from those in attendance? I have a question. Oh, oh. Sorry, I was gathering my notes. <laughs> <It's scared me. laughs> We're going to press pause real quick on public comment. Oh, well, would it be better if I go after? No, go ahead. Okay. Do your question. Um, I was curious about um, the potential environmental impact for a wildlife crossing um, in the uh, New Brighton area that was looked into with the retaining walls and the um, viaducts. Yeah, so if I, if I understand the question directly, I think you're asking about, you know, what would the project be installing some sort of uh, wildlife crossing to help them navigate, you know, the, yes. the, the viaducts of the walls. Yeah, great, great question. Thank you. So, um, as with any environmental impact report, you know, the project will be looking extensively at, you know, what the impacts will be to wildlife movement, uh, among many other things. Um, you know, sensitive plants, um, um, tree loss, and all that. And um, you know, if wildlife movement, if, if the EIR determines that you know there is a barrier to wildlife movement that needs to be mitigated, then um, the project will propose various um, mitigation um, solutions to, to help do that. And one of those things might be uh, some sort of wildlife crossing. Um, it hasn't come up on other rail trail segments, like the 8 and 9 EAR that was just certified by the city of Santa Cruz also has tall retaining walls. Um, and the the trail functioning as a barrier from sort of north south or inland to coastal wildlife movement wasn't really mentioned as an impact um, probably because there's significant um, development on either side of eight nine i think in this case um, to your point the the new brighton area is more of more natural area so that could mean additional impact that comes up uh, for 10 and 11. Um, 
So I think it's at this point it's too early to know um, if that will be an impact, but um, I will say that you know the EIR and the project uh, mitigation monitoring report will be identifying mitigation that's necessary to to mitigate um, some of these environmental impacts. So I'll note that, and, and we have a team of biologists and environmental um, specialists that'll be looking into this. And I'll just note that as a as a something for them to look into. So I appreciate that comment. Thank you. Um, and I had another another question um, for the potential trestle replacement um, 2027 and completion date, do we have an estimate on when construction might begin if that were to move forward? So 2027 was the completion of the environmental impact report. After the environmental impact report is complete, we would have to um, go through final design and um, secure funding for construction. So uh, final design usually takes about two years. So if we were to obtain funding right away, um, the earliest that we would anticipate being able to um, uh, do construction would be 2029. But like I said, that would be dependent upon funding. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of a follow up to that, has there been um, any looking into potentially creating a temporary bike path along the trestle because, you know, potentially replacing the trestle, if that is the direction we're moving, would take, you know, many years. Would it make sense to have some sort of a temporary bike path instead of going through the village? So are you, if you're referring to converting the existing trestle to a, a temporary uh, a yes. bike and pedestrian facility, that is the interim. That is the interim trail that uh, Rob mentioned, and that would require uh, cooperation from the railroad to rail bank the line. We looked extensively into the possibility of rail banking, and we received um, a lot of resistance to it, um, especially from um, the the railroad to uh, the north of us um, that goes up through Felton. Um, also, uh, we have an existing rail uh, freight rail operator that was also resistant to rail banking. So, um, can I interrupt it, you? I mean, specifically, just the trestle, which is would be replaced no matter what, right? That is correct. But the the the, the, um, the rail facility is regulated by the uh, Surface Transportation Board um, that. Uh, um, would like to, us to, to be using the rail facility for freight railroads and without the rail banking, they won't allow us to uh, uh, temporarily use portions of the rail line um, for. Um, uh, is, it, is it possible to use the trestle for rail without replacing it like at all? Is that yes. ever a possibility? Yes. So we could we stuff? could rehabilitate the, the trestle and then use it for a, um, a bike and pedestrian facility. So if that's, uh, you know, something that the, the city council would like, you know, further information on, we can certainly do so. You are a commissioner on the RTC, and I'd be more than happy to talk to you more about that and the possibilities there. Thank you. And that's all my questions. Great. Thank you so much. We can jump back to public comment. Thank you. I'm try to keep my blood pressure under control with this issue because clearly it's a circus. The whole, anyway, the whole trail um, issue is just has so many weird parts about it. But I'll just skip to a couple of points. I most of you know I ride my bicycle through Capitol Village every single day, uh, unless it's pouring rain. And I think Capitola is one of the most dangerous places to ride. And you had somebody earlier talking about it's getting more dangerous because of primarily kids on um, the e-bikes, uh, no helmets, no no respect for any kind of um, laws of the road. So it's it's pretty terrifying out there now. And some of the things that they want to create with this um, ultimate trail are just ridiculous with constantly having to cross lanes of traffic on your bicycle to get off the trail to get into the village um, coming out of the village one of the scariest parts and I I ride it every single day is coming up crossing the Stockton Bridge and having to go up the hill 
um, on cliff, the the people coming down Wharf Road, they don't really understand that those cyclists are having to go start from that stop sign up a hill. Most of the time you can't make eye contact with them because either the plants have grown up or they have their windows tinted and you really don't know if they're going to stop or if they're going to be, you know, pissed off because you're a horrible bicyclist and you're riding in front of them. And it's just a nightmare. And I know so Capito people in Capitola love our trestle the way it looks now. None of them want to see a cement monstrosity going across there. So I hope our representatives on the RTC will fight tooth and nail to try and find a way to get the interim trail and 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 make that trestle available. People want to be able their kids to be able to ride to school safely through Capitola, and um, they're. There's just so many things wrong with the way the plan is. Let's build this thing. Let's cut down all the trees and do put all that cement up. Oh, and then in 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 2027 or 2029, maybe we're going to find out that we can't have a train. Anyway, and I would like the RTC to strike sidewalks. Any mention of using sidewalks for bicycles in Capitola Village is a complete joke. It's terrifying now. People have been hurt by bicyclists on the sidewalks. We're down there every day trying to get the kids off the sidewalks. So I would like to see that stricken from every piece of communication from the RTC about Capitola Village. It just can't, it, it's never gonna happen. Um, plus losing parking to put in a, a bike path when there's so many other parts of it that are gonna be dangerous is. Thank you. realized why well, I don't see cars in any of these pictures. Everybody came here by train. The train was still active in those days. What a trade-off. What a trade-off. People coming from out of the area, I mean, coming here by train. People, uh, particularly in the tourist business, being able to come here without bringing their automobiles. Um, uh, the, the message has been sent. Three quarters of the people of this, of this county voted to preserve rail. And I'm, I'm expecting the council to, to, to support that. You know, the, the, the voice has been done, even the majority of Capitola voted to preserve rail. So it's it, the message is out there, and that's that's what we have to do. Yes, it's not a, it's not a short process. And it's 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 pretty ironic that where the rail, rail line goes, it goes in the middle of the highest population areas in the whole county. And um, there's a good reason for there to stay public transportation, I think. And, and certainly your grandmother and, and your kids are, you know, they're going to be the major enjoyers of it. Yes, probably most of them won't be around when it happens, but it, it, leave it there so it happens. In the meantime, uh, put the trail in. It's okay. And, and just, just plan for the whole thing. But don't take our public transportation away for the sake of a bicycle. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I just wanted to ask, nobody did state, are the e-bicycles going to be allowed on the same trail as the pedaling bicycles? Because that'd be, to me, very dangerous because I know on uh, Westcliff, you know, there's, when they didn't have e-bikes, you always went, you know, I'm coming, you know, but you can't hear it, the e-bikes. And I've had that experience too in Capitola. So I wanted to ask whoever was designing that, are they all going to be together? Pedal bikes and e-bikes. We can have a response. Thank you. Um, thank you for that question, Grace Blakesley with the Transportation Commission. Um, the trail is being designed to accommodate and allow e-bikes up to 20 miles an hour. And that would be for the entire length of the trail under development so far. Thank you. We do go about 35, I think. And who's going to monitor it? You wanted to come to the podium? Come on up to the mic so we everyone can hear you. I would just like to say when I see them going down Capitola Avenue, I was told by people that have them, they do go up to 35 miles an hour. 
who's going to monitor that they're only going to be going 20. I could see a lot of accidents happening with other real pedal bikes. And the other thing is I was, I thought the trestle was his, a historic thing. <laughs> and I mean, I see pictures, people taking pictures all the time from out of town and the historic, uh, whatever that little building is there. They told me that it was going to be rebuilt with the redwood. And then I don't know what happened. They just said there's going to be a lot of noise around here because we're restoring the whole trestle. And now I never even heard of them supposedly proposing to make it into some something way different. Thank you. Do you have another member of the public? Good evening, Mayor Kaiser and members of the city council and staff. My name is Paula Bradley. I'm a resident of Capitola and I'm a cyclist. I would like to ask the city council to accept staff's report and support support the ultimate rail trail design. I also support the city moving forward with the active transportation plan. The rail trail is a key component to developing an integrated transportation system in the county accessible to all. An electric passenger train has been determined to be the most efficient, lowest emission transportation op option. Trains move the most people at the lowest cost. The rail trail is within a quarter of a mile of 92 parks, 44 schools, and half of the county population. The rail trail will bring employees and customers to Capitola businesses without their cars and allow more visitors to attend popular festivals and events. It'll also contribute to safe routes to schools and activities like junior guards. I also share the viewpoint of there's a lot of problems with the throttle bikes and the e-bikes and kids riding through Capitola with no helmets at high rates of speed. Um, that's a separate issue that needs to be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other attendees? Seeing none, do we have any online? Great. John Moore, you can unmute yourself. Hello again. Uh, so robust public transit is the solution to so many of our problems, uh, health problems, traffic problems, congestion problems, even housing problems. It solves so many issues. So you need to move forward on this at this point. Uh, as far as the trestle being historic, we bought the trestle used. It's a secondhand trestle, just information for people who are interested in that. Uh, my question tonight, and obviously you might not answer it, but is, uh, are the easements, many of the properties, particularly on Depot Hill, uh, where looks like segment 10, I guess, goes through, uh, they're built into the RTC easements or the railroad easements. Uh, are those easements going to be taken back from those properties? Because the trail looks like it's built directly on those easements, as far as I can tell from the pictures. So that's my question. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you. Is there anybody else online? Okay. Well, I want to thank you for your presentation. I didn't know if council had any other comments moving forward. I, I have one comment. Is it like, yeah. like here. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I just wanna say that, um, I, I appreciate the the vision for the new Brighton crossover. Um, the way he, you presented it, Rob, Rob, of the secret passageway through. I think everyone knows what that is, and I, I really, I really appreciate that. Um, so great job thinking of think being creative with that part of the the design. Thank you. Great. I think I did just want to touch on something that was brought up multiple times. Um, 
before the presentation and after, but would be bike safety. I hope that moving forward um, as we progress in these plans, um, if there's a way to partner or figure out a program um, to really make sure that people utilizing the trail um, are doing so in a safe and appropriate manner. So thank you so much and um, looking forward to updates. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, so we have item 8C. This is the 401 Capitola Avenue appeal. Um, so the recommended action is uh, to adopt the resolution affirming the Planning Commission's decision to deny the application number 22-0282, seeking a conditional use permit, parking variance, and coastal development permit for a restaurant slash cafe at 401 Capitola Avenue, which is known as the Capitola Tap House. I'm going to turn this over to our attorney to give us a little description of um, the framework for this. Good evening. Good evening. Way back. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council members and community members. I am going to briefly go over the procedure that we'll be using for the appeal, just so everyone knows, and the standard of review. The procedure is written on this sheet, which I believe each council member has. It was just me. Okay. So I'll pass it along to my friend. <laughs> pass it on. It, it's pretty similar to any other item. Uh, the mayor has already introduced the item. I am describing the framework now. Um, the council it can ask questions about the framework after I describe it. Then the staff presentation, then questions from the council to the staff, and then the mayor will open the public hearing. Uh, the appellant will give a presentation up to eight minutes. Council will then ask questions of the appellant. The mayor will invite the public to speak on the item, public comment will be limited to three minutes per comment unless the mayor determines otherwise. Um, staff will, at the mayor's direction, respond to comments or questions from the public. Uh, the appellant will have then additional speaking time of up to four minutes. Uh, the council may then ask questions of the appellant and the appellant may respond. And then the mayor will close the cup public hearing and return the item to the council for deliberation and decision. The standard of review is de novo, meaning um, it's all before the council. The council uh, reviews the entire project with fresh eyes and can take action on any portion of the project. Are there any questions for me? No. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can turn it over is, for the uh, presentation. We have the ones for you. Let's test. Good. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'll be giving the staff presentation for this item. Uh, this is an appeal item or 401 Capitola Avenue, the Capitola Tap House. Uh, there was a proposal to convert the existing business to a restaurant, uh, also serving beer and wine and a parking variance that was reviewed by the Planning Commission and denied. And uh, the appellant has uh, brought it for the council this evening. Uh, my opening slide here is just an aerial photo. I have the um, convenience that uh, this is a pretty prominent site. It's right at the other side of the street across from City Hall. Uh, Capitola Tap House, uh, just uh, the other side of the trestle. You have a um, number of topics to cover um, in my presentation, so I just wanted to give you a bit of a roadmap. So we're, we'll look a little bit at uh, property permitting history. Uh, there's a code clarification. Uh, the word takeout establishment or takeout business is uh, layered throughout the staff report and is likely to be a, a topic of discussion this evening. So I want to uh, offer a clarification there. Uh, the proposal that was reviewed by the Planning Commission and denied, I will cover uh, the summary of that. And then I will touch on the applicant's basis for appeal. And as mentioned, the de novo repeal, appeal allows you to consider uh, modifications. We communicated that to the applicant. And so they have some alternatives that they would like considered this evening. 
Uh, and then there is a, uh, a big picture view of all ABC licenses in uh, the, all the mixed use zones within the city that I will go over and then close up with uh, the community input that we received on this item. So uh, again, at the other side of the street, Capitola Avenue, uh, this is a one and a half story building with a loft. It was completed in 2015, has operated either as retail or a takeout establishment since that time. Um, as far as just the permit, brief permit timeline in 2014, 2015, the Planning Commission approved the demolition of an, it was an existing duplex that had uh, gone past its uh, useful lifetime. The Planning Commission approved the new building that's there today uh, with the setback variance and a parking variance for four spaces for the retail use, which was Charlie and Co. Uh, the four spaces, one of the findings that was made at that meeting uh, was that the existing duplex called for four spaces and the proposed with retail also had a parking requirement of four spaces. So there was not an intensification of use. One of the key findings for the variance for that approval. 2019, the current owner uh, acquired the property and brought forward a proposal to the Planning Commission for a change of use from retail to a takeout restaurant with a limitation of six seats. Uh, with the zoning ordinance at that time, uh, six seats, takeout restaurant, and retail had the same parking requirement. So that was also not an intensification of use. And uh, to bring us current during the 2019 building permit review, uh, the applicant uh, made a slight change to their business model, shifting more from uh, more into a, a beverage service, which is what the kombucha and coffee is. At Planning Commission, the, the business model was more focused on a food uh, model and uh, just serving non-alcoholic beverages from uh, the existing PAP system is also compatible with uh, a takeout business and not an intensification. So uh, here's where I wanted to just take a moment and, and be real clear about what takeout food and beverage means in the zoning ordinance. It means an establishment where food and beverages may be consumed on premises, taken out or delivered, but where their customer area is limited to no more than 100. This is 2023's version of takeout food and beverage. Uh, I mentioned a six feet limitation, which was the case in 20. This specific code section has been amended. I mean, in 2019, when the project was approved, retail uses and, and takeout food and beverage establishments with six or fewer seats had the same parking ratio of one space to 240 square feet. This allowed for a bit of flexibility with tenant changeover in the village. Out establishments could come in where retail was for and not require any upgrades to parking. So just to be clear, the existing business has a six seat limit and they are uh, legal non-conforming under the old code. Uh, so getting into just the proposed project. So this verbal description, uh, this is what we shared with the planning commission when it was introduced. It was a restaurant uh, converting from a takeout restaurant to serve beer and wine at a new kitchen prep area to expand customer seating from six to 26 seats and for a parking variance for uh, all required on-site parking. Clarification here is that um, the gross proposal for uh, parking demand was 11 spaces, but going back to that variance that was approved in 2015, um, that is applicable here. And so there's a net requirement of seven parking spaces and benefit for uh, properties that are proposing an intensification uh, if they already have either an existing variance or a legal non conformity So the proposed variance that the Planning Commission design, denied was for seven parking spaces. Uh, getting into just the existing floor plan. So this is just to give you uh, some history of what is there now, 575 square feet of customer area, um, they have six seats, as mentioned, and kitchen equipment is focused on like, beverage service. Uh, there's a line of sinks and the 32 taps. Mm -hmm. And this is the proposed floor plan that the Planning Commission saw. And um, this was for 485 square feet of customer area, 26 seats, 
uh, prep table and under counter refrigerator. Uh, that's this uh, green area. So this area was to be modified internally to accommodate these. commercial toaster, ice storage, and an under-counter refrigerator and a prep table. Okay, uh, just getting into, this is just a, a zoning map really uh, for reference. So the star is the subject property. As mentioned, it's in the mixed use neighborhood uh, adjacent to the trestle. It's the, basically the, the nearest mixed use neighborhood property to the village, purple. And then just behind is in the R1 that lines Riverview Avenue. So uh, this is really detailed in your staff report. The basis for appeal, um, the applicant wrote three primary points that, uh, that was the reason for their appeal. So the staff report noted that the use was allowable, but the focus of the denial was based on parking. So staff doesn't really have uh, an, an issue with this statement. Um, it, there was a statement in the, the planning commission staff report that talked about mixed use neighborhood could have a restaurant use permit if parking was provided. Um, so the basis of denial uh, and variance findings for the parking were not able to be um, The second one is two of the three commissioners had based their decision on part of the application was not before them. The elaboration here is there was some concern that commissioners based their decision on the kitchen facilities being inadequate. Uh, there was some discussion about the plans uh, not being complete and fully defined, but ultimately when the commission made their motion, uh, they were pretty clear that the concern was uh, that they were not able to make positive findings for approval. Uh, and then the last point is that findings for variance can be made. So uh, the thought here is that because there was already a variance approved in 2015, that the property does have some reasons and variance. The staff response to this is just that a variance um, is really tied to the specifics of a project it's proposed for, and a variance approved in 2015 was specifically for that project and not for the project. Uh, as mentioned, this is de novo review, so you can consider anything uh, that was presented or any alternatives. And so the applicant did provide, along with their original appeal, three other considerations. So I actually printed out uh, this these tables because this is a lot of information. It's going to be a little tight on the screen. It wants to follow along, and I think it's a good one for the applicant as well. I won't get into the original application. Uh, I'll, I'll get into immediately to their option number one. So the concept here was to remove the parking variance, maintain the takeout business, uh, move forward with 16 taps for beer and wine service, and limit the number of seats to six seats. And the staff concern here is, is really that, that this, this is better defined as a, a bar or lounge or maybe a restaurant but um, just removing 20 seats uh, doesn't really isn't consistent with the takeout business. And the option number two, um, there was a proposal to change the way that uh, the, the beverages would be delivered to customers, so limiting pours potentially to two per customers and filling two containers to go. Um, there really isn't a an ABC license that corresponds with limiting number of pours or size of pours. So we really kind of view option number two the same in terms of the concern here as option number one. <clears throat> and option number three is somewhat similar. Uh, operationally, an employee would fill a container, put a lid on it, put it in a refrigerator for sale to a customer, could then select it and consume it on site. Uh, the concern here is that that this uh, this act could potentially just be performative. It could be done uh, over a, the course of a few seconds, and the, the property would be operating effectively as a bar. So those are our concerns with the proposed alternatives. Uh, here I'm getting into just the big picture list. You've got 27 total ABC licenses issued within all mixed use zones. 
And this is really kind of just for reference. This isn't the entire project. Getting into what is, um, we looked at it through the lens of what's in the mixed use. And so we found five businesses, uh, two are retail, so they're really not comparable, uh, but there are three restaurants. So Taqueria, Gales, they both have uh, parking. And then there's the avenue that does not have parking. Uh, businesses have a tap system. And uh, the avenue, we were able to find records dating back into the mid 80s. Uh, so their parking standing is legal non -consent. We look at it through the lens of what it, what's uh, an ABC license issued with a takeout business. We've got them, they're all in the mixed zone. None of these businesses have parking and none of them have a tap system. All right, and then we looked at um, businesses with taps. And so this, this is a list of 11. All of them are either bars or restaurants. All of them are in the village. Uh, they all have long-standing either variances or legal non-standing parking. Uh, the most the most recent one that I could find in city archives is Trestles, which established in 1998 under a different name, uh, but with a parking variance. Uh, there's another one on this list that is. Um, bit of an outlier, which is English Ales Brewery. So there's two of the, that list of 27 that uh, are outlets. So these are production related. These uh, ABC has a specialty licensing for wineries or breweries uh, to have a retail presence. These two are that, uh, Armida Winery in Stockton and the English Ales is a microbrewery, License 23, and based in uh, Marina. And so this is one of their retail outlets. So um, just kind of summarizing what, if, all of that information, um, the staff had recommended denial, could not make uh, findings. Uh, planning Commission uh, came to the same conclusion, unable to make findings. Uh, in looking at the the information that I just presented in the series of tables, uh, it, the recommendation that we're, we are making is consistent with code. It's also consistent with how code has been implemented over the past, uh, as far back as we could find records. Uh, there just there is not a, a restaurant or there's not a takeout business with taps in the mixed use neighborhood zone. And um, they all have some standing or long standing with parking in terms of either legal non-conforming or variances. Um, one other thing I'll offer here is just um, amongst the planning department, we do get inquiries often about vacancies and tenant turnover in, in the village and uh, the mixed use village. And this conversation happens a lot. So the, when the conversation turns to, I want, I want to uh, have a bar or I want to have a restaurant with alcohol, um, the conversation usually quickly turns to parking. And so we are, we are consistent with potential tenants or owners when uh, these properties become available. I know that was my summary, uh, just kind of a little footnote here. We did get some letters of both support and opposition, and uh, the owner also provided a uh, a list of signatures that uh, that were collected. So, with that, I'm going to uh, conclude and remind that uh, we are recommending that the council affirm the planning commission's denial, and uh, I've attached a, a resolution for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, uh, council. Questions. I have a couple. Sure. Um, in your, there's two slides. Your in your report, you said that the original application was a verbal. You you, you used the term verbal. They 
with the um, with their proposal. They didn't submit something for that. You said it was a verbal. Um, was that just were you just saying verbally they said it, or I was just making sure there was a formal proposal for their original plan with the taps and so forth? Or maybe I misheard you. I, I I'm not following the context. I'm sorry. So in your presentation, yeah. when you um go to the slide and yeah, there is there it says proposal, and you said that they. Um, it was a verbal proposal. Did you mean that they just called you up and said, this is what we want to do, or we want to do these other things, or was that the only project they brought forward to planning commission? Uh, the plan For the planning commission, there was only one. Okay, got it. Um, and then in the other slide, you had the property highlighted in yellow, like it, it's residential, and just for clarification, it's R1, not MU, uh, commercial in the slide. I'm just trying. It was further down. Mm -hmm. Colorful slide. There yeah. you go. Is it highlighted in yellow with the star because it's R1 or is it an MU commercial? Um, the, the, the property with the star is the subject property and that's MU. It is. That's, a, that's my question. Okay. It was matching the others and I thought that's what the screen colors. Okay. No, no, that I just want to make sure it's um it is yellow. Okay. That's why I was just confused about what we were talking about and what that um about that corridor on Capitola Ave. Um and then my last question is in regards to this document here in the options where it specifies number of seats. It goes from 26 to 6. And it, are these options 1, 2, and 3? Suggesting six because it doesn't require any parking variance. Is that why the number is so low? It, the, the effort here is, I think the applicant is trying to maintain out restaurant and maintain those six seats with these three options. Okay, and that was my last question. Thank you. Do we know um, fire marshal occupancy for this building? I, I ran that calculation actually at one point during the plan review, and uh, I think it was in the 30s. Okay. I have a question. Um, is there um, anything in the zoning code that explicitly prohibits a takeout restaurant from having taps? Uh, there's nothing that specifically prohibits it, but in the So based on historical context, but there's no actual rules in our code that prohibits that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I don't have any questions at this time, um, but uh, let's go out to the opponents. Yes. So you guys can come up. You'll have eight minutes. Hi. Uh, good evening, city council members and my supporters here and also on Zoom. Um, so, uh, yeah, this has been a four years of battle for my business. Um, first, this um, I have quite a struggle with the um, pandemic and also um, the shutdown, and I won't be able to fully um, start my business in a full capacity. And um, I um, hit by just so many directions. So I... Um, this business almost on the brink of closing a store, but I refuse to give up. Um, and I know as a small business owner, um, it's really difficult to make it through tough times. Um, and I believe if I could just find the right investment, uh, I could make it through to the other side. Um, the new cell port system 
is really very smart, just like anything else. We have changed from phone to computer technologies. Um, giving this business uh, be able to use will be uh, a much need of infusion life for my business. The cell core draft based system has been a hit with customer as it offers a very unique interactive um, experience. Um, I took a chance investing in this system and I now I'm asking the city council members to take a chance on my business and support my venture with the cell draft beer system. Um, this will add a, addition, a great addition to the city and will be a safe, fun way for people to enjoy beer. Um, with your hand in hand support, I will be able to keep my business afloat and thrive maybe even expand in the future. And thank you for your support. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Council Members. Thank you for hearing this appeal and the de novo review of alternatives. And thank you to the staff. I know that they've worked very hard with us over the months. Um, I'm a Amy's representative. My name is Lynn. I'm going to talk quickly, so I apologize. Um, Amy's uh, shy but one of your more enthusiastic small business owners uh, she loves capitola she wants her business to to be a draw for the community and she's lucky to be in an environment that's a year-round weatherproof business and can be a 12 month of the year draw and promote your economic vitality um, in her first application for a restaurant cafe uh, the the denial recommendation really focused on parking I would submit to you because we are, we did want a review from you for that. And um, the your land use policy 1-1 and your muni code 17-76050, both uh, are, are ordinances and regulations that favor on-site parking alternatives. And so, uh, and this is a, a, a business with a topographical uh, hardship in providing its own on-site parking. So we, it, it is within the realm of your purview to grant the variance if you want to. If you do not want to, um, we ask and thank you for considering the alternatives. Um, we are interested in, in knowing what you would support and uh, Amy wants to make the tweaks that make you comfortable. Um, right now, the staff recommendation for denial, we removed the, the 26 seats and went back to six to remove the parking problem. Uh, we were told you can't have parking, so you can't have this business. Okay, we'll take away the need for the parking. Oh, then we got, yeah, you still can't have this business because now a tap system is incompatible with a takeout establishment. And it's really what you want is a bar and we don't want a bar there. Well, that's a subjective opinion um, that you're right. There is no law, ordinance, rule, regulation that states a tap system automatically translates to a bar. Um, it's so, um, we would say, please look at the totality of the circumstances. If you've been to Amy's business or even look through the windows, you see a light, bright, sterile environment more akin to a yogurt shop than a bar. Um, it's, uh, it closes at 8 p.m. It's minors welcome. It's family friendly. Uh, this We all know what a bar is, and this isn't a bar. Um, the open container concerns, Castagnola has a, is a takeout establishment with uh, sales of, of alcohol and uh, there's not that didn't prevent them from getting that permit. Uh, open container can be fixed by signage and enforcement. The um, length of time someone can stay, well, there's no li limit to that now, but the concern really, we all know what it is, right? Hours of drunken consumption and, and the impacts to the neighborhood. That can be solved for definitively with the technology system that Amy proposes. Uh, RFID technology that cuts off the amount of pores or the size of pores, um, that's going to limit the amount of time someone's going to sit there and imbibe. Um, we have the three alternatives. I won't go into them here because I'm running out of time, but um, regular pour, a couple regular pours. Some sample flights. I won't go into them in too much detail. <laughs> Some sample flights, but then say, okay, I like that one. Can I get a pre-filled bottle of that to sit here with my salad or my rice bowl and enjoy here? 
Um, the concern that if alcohol is flowing through the traps, you won't, the city will not allow there to be any on-site consumption of anything, even a cup of coffee, because it's too akin to a bar. That on-site, flo that flowing through the taps can be those bottles that we wish to sell if, if we're not allowed for self poor self-consumption on-premises. Those um, bottles can be pre-filled and pre-sealed outside of the presence of the customers early before it closes. There are taps, that, some of these taps go into the kitchen and are not accessible to the customers. That could come from there. Um, you could do the RFID technology that makes those taps that dispense alcohol only open to the staff, people who work there. So you can pre-fill, pre-fill, pre-seal bottles, and it's no different than selling a can of Budweiser, which is allowed at Cascagnola, which is proposed to be allowed by staff here. Okay, you want to sell some pre-filled buds and wines and things like that? Fine with your with your food. How is that different from pre-filled, pre-sealed from Amy's taps? She's simply trying to take advantage of this novel, cool draw. Um, English Ales is a re has a retail CUP, uh, and that's much more of a bar and look and feel than Amy's establishment will ever be. You don't have another kombucha shop in town. This is a really cool concept, and I think we can tweak it to make you comfortable with amount, size, all that kind of thing. Um, um, there are three takeout establishments right now that have alcohol. Um, the bottle, Daily Grind Bottle Shop, the Castagnolas, and um, Little Co's. Um, and I am out of time, but we are here for questions. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Council, do you have questions for the appellant? I do. Um, I am just curious as to, um, you just referenced possibly having the taps that would contain alcoholic beverage be just in a portion of the restaurant that wouldn't be accessible by, um, it would just be for the employees, right? right. Um, so how many taps would, is that right now? So, um, so first of all, they can all be inaccessible to customers with the RFID technology, right? Because you have to have a card or a bracelet or something to make them work. But the ones that are specifically in the kitchen, which if you've seen this, is a large commercial kitchen uh, space. How many are, are like around that corner? Yes, eight. Eight, okay. And so is that what, what you would be, be proposing overall? Is those eight just be used for alcohol and the rest would be kombucha, coffee, and the rest? If the council does not want to allow a self-pour consumption on site model, so if you want to allow somebody to come up and say, oh, I want to try that one and pull it themselves, whether it's a 16 ounce cup or a four ounce flight, if that, you know, then they have to have a card key RFID technology that limits them to whatever is the rule. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, but if you don't want that at all, if you want the customer doesn't touch an alcohol tap, then it can be achieved either by the alcohol taps being wired as you were to only staff or use of the ones that are even physically out of, out of reach. Okay. And as the, um, I know there is a proposed plan to, is it to redesign the kitchen to make it more um, able to produce food more types of food? <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So the uh, revised uh, floor plan is uh, to giving a, a, a more service food area. Okay. Yeah, and that also approved by Santa Cruz Health Department. Okay, great. Thank you. Can I follow up on a, with that? So in the options that are for modifications here are the alternative options. Um, for the others, not with the original application, is it to be assumed that the kitchen is part of those options automatically? Because I don't see it mentioned in the, the breakdown here. Food service is contemplated for all the options. Okay, so that's... And to be, uh, to be more clear on that, for the particular takeout rather than restaurant, you would need that those modifications to the kitchen still for the takeout options. 
Uh, it's my, I, I'm not an ABC lawyer, <laughs> but it's my understanding that um, as a takeout establishment with a type 41 on sale beer and wine license, you have to offer food. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just like a bar with incidental food is what you might think that like you're sitting at the big dark bar and there's a bowl of pretzels. Sorry. Okay. Um, that's incidental food to alcohol consumption, right? A little bowl of nuts, a little bowl of pretzels. Um, this is this isn't full restaurant meal, but it's like sure. sandwiches, so, salads. So the, the piece of the puzzle we're missing here, if it were to go to the other options, one, two, or three that specify proposed use as takeout are the possible changes needed for the kitchen. And so I'm not seeing that in this. Because I don't think that that issue, just like at planning, I don't think it's before you. I think actually that that's an issue for the ABC and the count, the Board of Health. Okay, I'm going to look over to staff if that's true, if that needs to be how that would work. So, yeah, ABC does have a requirement for a bona fide kitchen for a Type 41 license. And the definition that goes along with that says that it's got to be more than just salads and sandwiches. So it's got to serve substantial meals. Um, but that is an ABC determination. I have talked to the ABC rep that is managing this case, uh, and he has. So ABC, with their process, they don't, they won't get ahead of the local review. I don't have anything in, in writing from them, so I only have a phone call with him and an understanding that the kitchen, as it stands, uh, is not meeting that standard. Okay, so how do we not get the cart before a horse or a horse before a cart? In, right. in any decisions brought made from the council on this proposal, you mentioned that you did have a conversation with this representative and they were in agreement. Did I hear that correctly? Uh, I didn't. Um, I, Amy has, has met and spoken. I, I think that the point is that if you give the CUP or you, um, or you, and you allow the use, then she jumps to the next level of hurdles, which is with ABC proving sufficient kitchen, sufficient food, all that kind of stuff. Okay. And Might fail that, there. Gotcha. I'm, I'm, I got you down. So, okay. yeah, so there is no active um, liquor license at this point in time. Correct. Okay. Okay, so now I do have a question. Go for it. Okay, yeah. so, and I'm not sure who this is for, it's just so everyone just ears <laughs> open, I guess. Um, okay, so if we were to approve the TAPS, and then it goes to ABC to approve the liquor license. So nothing would happen with the taps changing until the ABC gives a liquor license. And that would be dependent on whether or not the kitchen is up to code. But if they say it's not, then nothing changes on the taps because at that point we can't allow it, right? Like it's it can't come back to us for another appeal at that point. We don't decide what ABC allows, correct? Yeah, it, it, most of this would happen probably during the building permit. So in, internal modification to the building and fit out with kitchen equipment, the city would get involved with the building. I need an, an answer. Yeah, that doesn't answer, answer my answer. question. Yeah. I don't know if this answers your question either, but I think that the council would, uh, if the council wishes to grant the appeal any sort of project that project condition on the permit that requires the business the permit that is consistent with the approval if the not able to secure that permit from the business and we can't change that Correct. We can't, we can, it couldn't come back to us saying ABC said we couldn't get our liquor license. Can you guys tell us we can have the liquor license anyway? Oh, well, yes. right. Like we can't do anything about that once, that if ABC decides this can't happen, we can't change that. Sure. That okay. Part is correct. The applicant can't change that. Would that start back at planning commission or would that come straight to us? That, was, that would start the whole process over. Brian and Katie, but I think that would probably start. Yeah. 
outcome that you know that if it was well what the conditions were prejudice is the other yeah thing. i'm pausing because i i think our code that limits us on the same project or a similar but okay it could, um, so that would only apply with a denial um okay so oh, can I jump off of that yeah, question yeah, no, please, a little yeah. bit? So regarding the kitchen, because that was part of the original application and there were some questions about the kitchen, does that piece of the puzzle have to go all the way back to planning commission? So if they got feedback from ABC and then CDB, whatever the other group is that says this is how the kitchen needs to be, and they say, these are the provisions that need to be part of this kitchen outline for, for you to build, what then happens? Um, they come back with the design to planning commission. Planning commission can approve or not approve. What are those steps? Changes to an interior uh, kitchen in a existing commercial space very likely can be approved just by building staff by the staff. You're working in your kitchen, putting in new range goods, new refrigerator, that stuff. It wouldn't go to the planning commission. I mean, the planning commission. And is that a, is that a guarantee so that the applicant doesn't need to jump through a million more steps? And yeah, it's just, you have to get a building permit. Right, right, right. Yeah. Interior remodel to put a kitchen in is consistent with the depending on what you issue. Now, to be clear, and I think Sam said this from is if ABC came back and said, you don't have a kitchen and you can't have a kitchen for whatever reason because it's a structural building and you can totally get our type of liquor license, then I think you go back to Kristen's question. The applicant would need to resubmit and say, I want to have an application for That would start a new process. Right, rather than their takeout thing or this particular variant. I think I, I'm looking at our appellant just to make sure it's clear what what those steps are because it could possibly we don't know what ABC would say. Yeah, we don't know what comes after us. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. So, yeah. so to clarify, ABC inspector came to my business site, um, so he has no objections with the kitchen at all, and he, the license is to serve a bona fide meal not a bona fide kitchen. So the kitchen is there as long as if I have enough, um, even uh, counter appliances, just like any other takeout restaurant to serve a meal during my business hours. And that's sufficient. Was that when the, sorry, Mayor. Is that Go okay? for it. Is that when you presented it as a restaurant or when you presented to ABC as a continuation of takeout uh, as current uh, CUP as a takeout restaurant. Okay. Yes. Okay. Hmm. Okay. 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 Thank you. No. No. Okay. Um. Let's see. Do we have any public comment on this item? Well, good evening, Madam Mayor and Council people. Thanks for coming tonight and hearing us. Um, on behalf of Amy, uh, probably like you, I had a hard time uh, processing the whole concept of what a tap room is. Um, maybe some of you have gone wine tasting and observed how you taste wine and spit some out. Well, this is very similar. No one's going to be there and lounging around, or it's not a bar. No one's going to be chugging down big, you know, half pint or pitchers of beer. It's not about that. I saw people coming into the tap house and they were asking about, well, are you going to be carrying this type of beer or that type of beer? And I'm going, I'm not a beer drinker, so it doesn't mean anything to me. But I, apparently, out there are some very serious beer drinkers who have a special palate, they could taste things. I couldn't tell a, a you know a Budweiser from a Modelo. 
Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of it's just swirling around a misunderstanding of what uh, what the concept is about. But um, I can tell you one thing, Amy has an incredible positive attitude and I hope that spills into the rest of the village because, uh, you know, they could right now, everyone kind of needs a boost. And uh, what else are you gonna say? Oh, but what, what is Capitola about anyway? Capitola is about change. How many changes have you seen just in the last two years, three or four years? You know, we have a new mall owner who comes and says, we can't make money in a mall anymore. We can't do anything. Well, things are changing. Yeah, okay, what, what can we do? Rewrite the zoning to residential, <laughs> not a problem. That's a, that's a big change. Um, you know, we have uh, other situations that uh, arose like uh, COVID and uh, let's put parklets out. Yeah, if you would have mentioned that before COVID, I think it would have been thrown out the door. Um, but it's a change. And the city has been willing to accommodate uh, changes. Um, because Amy is uh, 50, Amy's establishment is 50 feet or so away from the village line. Okay. <laughs> What can you say? Uh, I'm going to borrow a term that was I heard about several years ago when uh, people that lived out of this area wanted to be on committees and, and probably even the council, and that is sphere of influence. And I would say Amy's building is within the sphere of influence of the village. I mean, you know, you pass it, you're immediately in the village. So, and that's all I've got to say. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Hi, my name is Kathleen Byrne, and um, I'm speaking in support of Amy's permit application for her restaurant to serve beer and wine. Uh, the the self-serve alcohol and beverage dispense technology is currently legal in 45 states, including California. I've personally spoken with the ABC representative in Salinas and was told self pour taps are legal in California and cities which do not restrict their use. And I did thoroughly read uh, the Capitola codes and there are no restrictions in that code uh, that would apply to her application for a restaurant that serves beer and wine. And Patrons over 21 are limited to two drinks per person monitored by issuing a card and this limitation of alcoholic drinks promotes drinking in moderation, thus not encouraging a long stay at the restaurant. With this limitation, this system is different from a restaurant or bar in which patrons can easily order alcoholic drinks without the monitoring of the number of drinks consumed. Now, Amy, in the last hearing, she gave up her idea of 20 seats or more is down to six seats, which uh, I don't see any reason why she couldn't got the variance because it does mention if there are other properties in the same vicinity and the same or the same zone, which there are the same vicinity, there are the cork and fork and the trestle, and she's not allowed to have the same uh, privileges as they are with the parking. But she moved on and went, okay, only six. So she, um, and I find it ironic that the planning department staff does not support the self-serve draft system for the reason it would make patrons stay too long. When in reality, the self pour system automatically limits patrons to have two drinks with only six seats, the two drink limit would help open up seating for customers waiting to be seated. Amy has let me know that she invited the planning department to come and see how self pour works. And uh, not one person came or took the time to come in and experience how the self pour system works and especially how it limits drinks 
rather than encouraging customers to drink more and stay longer. By the planning department not supporting the self-port, can't do any more. It's only a couple more sentences. Okay, yeah, quickly wrap it up if you don't. Okay. Um, I'll just wrap it up down here. Um, instead of the planning department taking direction from the state and city codes, it seems the restrictions are being placed on Amy's business and she does not have the same privilege enjoyed by other businesses in the same vicinity, in the same zone, as not being supported, even though she is in alignment with the state laws and city codes. And she's worked passionately honoring the state codes and city codes, and there is not a logical reason why she should be denied her efforts to provide locals and visitors with an innovative restaurant with a great menu to stop by and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Christy and I live off of 26 Ave. Um, I met Amy right before the COVID shutdown. That was three years ago. And I usually concentrate my walks on the other side of Capitola and it was just by accident I walked this way. Um, I was so surprised to see the Capitola tap room and got to meet Amy. Amy was super friendly. Um, and eager. She definitely made an impression on me. I mean, literally in like 20 minutes. Uh, she talked about her vision of the shop and I was so impressed with her bravery to open up a business on her own. Then a few months later when COVID hit and everything stopped, I was really actually worried about her, you know, because it was such bad timing to open up a new business. And then just last weekend, I was here checking out the museum and I saw that she was open. And so I was so happy to see her again. And I tried one of her kombuchas. Uh, I asked her about hard kombuchas because I know that's like such a popular thing these days. And she got to talking to me about this application that's going on. And so I thought I would come and just, you know, just share my experience with her. I barely, you know, know her. Um, I've only talked to her a few times, a couple times, but I feel like that she's super eager um, and willing to help out with, uh, to work with the committee, you know, to get something going. Um, I do know that uh, Capitola Tap House will, build, will fill the void. Uh, downtown Santa Cruz has got like the Roxa, which is that, you know, that sells like elixirs and then Mellow Mellow that offers Kava. And I do, what I do know, is that I do like kombuchas and having that closer to home rather than having to go to downtown Santa Cruz would be amazing. So thank you. It. Great. Hello, uh, my name is Mario Beltramo and I'm here in support of the appellant. Uh, I do that and I do this not because I like the appellant, although I very much do like the appellant. I'm doing this because I love Capitola. I live in Capitola. I walk Capitola every day. I want Capitola to survive and I want Capitola to thrive. And I want the businesses in Capitola to thrive and represent this town as it should be represented. And I think that entails bringing in good people to run those businesses, number one, and secondly, to have a good business to run. The reason the business is good were amplified and spoken very eloquently by Amy's representative, and I'm not going to repeat that. With regard to the parking issue, I think people come to Capitola and they park, and then they walk around Capitola's village. They don't come just to go to the tap room, they don't come just to go to any particular restaurant or any particular establishment. They come to the town. They find parking. If any of you walk around town, and I know you all do, we don't have a lack of parking in this town. We have adequate parking in this town. 99% of the time, you can find parking very close by 
right behind the police department, there are two large parking lots. Most of the time, those parking lots are substantially empty. People can find parking. Amy's business application should not be denied because of the lack of, of parking. The way I look at it, there's a, it, it's like a stool, a three-legged stool. The first leg of that stool is the business owner. And Amy is the type of business owner that we want to have. She's a good representative for this community. She's diligent. She works hard. Those are the kind of people we want to entice to open businesses. The second leg of the stool is you, the city council. You've got the opportunity to help somebody succeed in business, in a business in this community that's going to bring people in, that's going to bring money in. And you can do it. You've got the power to do it. It may not necessarily have been done along these exact same terms, but that doesn't mean that you can't do it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. You can do it. You're the second leg. The third leg is the ABC. The ABC will look at this and say whether, yes, her establishment meets the state's requirements for the serving of this alcohol. If they do, then there should be no reason why this application should not be fully approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other in-house members of the public? Good evening, uh, council members. My name is uh, Ed Newman. I've uh, lived or uh, and or worked in Capitola for one half century now. And uh, I'm here to represent seven businesses that are located at 331 Capitola Avenue, which is right across the trestle from uh, 401 Capitola. We support the staff recommendation. Uh, the concern is, is uh, parking. And that has been our concern uh, from the beginning, the first application uh, by Amy. And uh, the reason is that we, we have very limited parking at 331 Capitola Avenue. Most of it is under the railroad trestle right next to where her business is. And uh, we have a long-term lease on that area. And we are concerned that if uh, we were concerned with the original variance and we're concerned with any expansion of the business in the direction of restaurant, uh, bar, uh, and so forth, because of the pressure that that would put on the seven businesses that utilize the limited parking at 331 Capitol Avenue. We don't want to be in a uh, ongoing uh, wrestling match with uh, people who want to park there short-term, mid-term, whatever, because it's convenient for them to to do that when they go to her um, her place. I mean, we 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 really do wish the applicant uh, well in terms of finding a viable uh, business plan for her property, but but think that this is not it. Um, one other concern, which I I hesitate to raise, but I will raise because there's been some public comment about um, the. Um, uh, I don't want to be personal, but you should be aware that there has been some history here of disregard of the rules so that what you hear tonight, you may not be able to uh, rely on uh, down the road 100%. When the first um, approval for this applicant was made, there were some building plans that were approved, and then she um, proceeded to uh, disregard the plans and a notice of violation um, was issued and work had to be torn out and uh, went back to square one. And then she went and th did some more work that was not uh, within the approved plans and a second notice of violation had to be issued and uh, that work had to be removed also. And so that's kind of a, um, a side concern in that uh, we 
don't want to see um, one thing being presented and something else actually happening that affects our parking situation. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis Norton, I'm not here to speak for or against alcohol at this at this place. Um, I'm I'm here to speak about consistency and, and giving to the zoning ordinance avenues for people that have this kind of situation an avenue to be able to keep their business going. If you if you walk across the street right now, all the way from the corner of of, of uh, Riverview, all the way down to the trestle, there's two residential structures. All the commercial has gone out of there, except for her building there. Um, with a city that's encouraging people to park on a remote lot, that becomes a major major passageway into the village, and that's some of the places the places past the trestle have done well. The ones up on this end have not not done so well. Hopefully, they'll fill back in. But uh, we can't afford to have vacancies. We got a mall that's vacant here in the city. We need we need businesses in here, and that's what people come here for. Um, there should be a way, an avenue for a business like this to buy into Pacific Boat. And at one time, the city, before we actually put the meters in, and I, I match, I match that's 50 years, right here. Um, before we put, he remembers no meters there too. But uh, before, we, we talked about the idea of doing a parking district. That still can be done. A parking district would actually be set up as, as the mechanism is the parking lots that we have now and the possibility of someday being able to build another story on the one, the one, uh, the, the upper level there and making it a real thorough type of traffic circulation system where people come to town and park up there. My point is, is that that businesses like this and and believe me, we the city has not been consistent with this. And you want to walk through the village with me, I can name three to four businesses that were offered without parking and came in here and are selling alcohol right now. But uh, but given given an av avenue such as a parking district. We give an avenue for a business like this to say, okay, I'm willing to pay for, for four or five, six, whatever their parking thing is in exchange for getting a viable business done or a business. And I, I think this is the beginning. You're going to be facing this quite a bit through the next for the coming years, but businesses that want to expand, the only, the only businesses that can, can make it here now are the ones that have been here long enough where they've had established and they're tied in parking that's out there which the public pays for, by the way. That's public land. This is public land. And so you as a council have a direction as to, can give direction as to how we use our land and do it. I really I really don't want more parking pulling. We can, I can't even imagine people pulling into the lot next to the trestle there to park there. I, I really can't, because you'd never be able to back on the road. But I can see giving them parking up here if they pay for it a lot and start, start a pet parking district and a parking bank where businesses can expand on themselves, businesses can prosper in this in this community without shooting them away. Because we can't we can't afford to shoot people like Amy away from here. We need her in our town, and and this and particularly the village right now. And so, um, I'm, I'm hoping that you find an avenue for this business to be able to uh, to to make itself successful. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in house? Seeing none, we can go online. Diane. Diane, you can unmute yourself. Hello, Diane. Following on we have Tanya Morgan. We can also allow to speak and then we'll come back to Diane. Okay, Diane, we will come back to you. Tanya, if you could unmute yourself. Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm in San Jose and I'm not, I don't have all the history with Capitola as a lot of the speakers, but I just wanted to talk for a second um, because I happen to be in Capitola and I've been to the Tap House and I was, and I was really captivated by it. I mean, it's a pretty amazing system and I was, I was very impressed by the technology and the cleanliness and I got to talking to Amy and her whole vision. And, um, you know, and, and that was, I don't know, months and months and months ago. And, um, 
me in San Jose, of course, lots of people I know pop over the hill for all sorts of reasons. And every single person I hear who's going to Santa Cruz or some place over there, I'm always telling them they've got to go to Capitola, they've got to go to the Tap House. I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a real attraction for the town, and um, and the gentleman who spoke earlier about people, you know, coming to Capitola, parking and walking around. I mean, I know that's what I do. I know that's what the people I know do, and. You know, we are local visitors, but we visit a lot. It's, you know, you have a nice town over there. Um, so I just wanted to say that that I think it's a real gem and I think it's a real um and I think it's a real attraction for the town. And that's all I really have to say. Great, thank you. Okay. Diane, if you can, unmute yourself. Okay, I think we're having issues hearing you. So I think we will um, close uh, public comment here. And um, we're gonna take it back to Council, if um, if we have any follow up questions for staff, anything? Okay. Um, let's see. I don't have any questions either. So then we can invite the appellants back up if you'd like to touch on any other topics that were brought up. Thank you, Mayor and Vice Mayor and Council. Uh, I was I was going to say in response to. Um, to the staff report that said there was an objection and I, I, where I didn't see any, I didn't, I didn't see any in the, the packet. I don't know if I missed it, but then I understand Mr. Newman spoke. Thank you, Mr. Newman for your perspective. Um, but the ba a large part of the, his complaint was parking and um, that's not fair. We're, we've removed the, the increase in seats and the intensification of use and the need for parking variance. So, um, uh, it looks to me to be a pretty well supported proposal. Um, the kitchen critiques that came back in the fall were when this was being proposed as a restaurant cafe, and they weren't rulings because it wasn't really ripe yet. It was just like a warning, like, I don't know if I see this kitchen happening right. But the fact of the matter is, as a takeout establishment, the kitchen is sufficient. Look at Castagnola. It is a takeout deli, sandwiches uh, with beer and wine permit. It doesn't have to be a five course meal. Uh, so why not Amy's? Can, can she have the same thing? And does it have to be a refrigerator of what we were calling the Budweiser example and not to throw shade on Budweiser, but you know, it'd be much more unique and much more novel and much more fun to be able to utilize for a cool tap system for a variety of unique beverages that you don't get in any, just anywhere in this town. The hard kombuchas, craft beers, local wines, that kind of thing. In five years, I did a PRA request. In five years, um, I, I asked for any, any businesses, takeout, restaurant, retail, in MUN or MUV, who had requested CUPs to serve alcohol, retail, takeout, bar, lounge, restaurant, whatever, that have been denied. How many in five years have requested it and been denied? Only Amy's. She is the only denial. Why? Everything else is getting approved. Staff is willing to allow Amy to sell these outside cans, you know, Budweiser, that kind of thing. But, or to be retail only and not allow any consumption on the premises just for sale outside. Why? English Ales is retail, CUP, retail CUP. Have you ever gone in there? It's like an English pub open till midnight on the weekends, belling up to the bar, no menu in sight. Um, Amy is not trying to be a bar. This is not going to be a bar, but we do hope that the council looks at all the alternatives because the idea of someone coming up and doing the self sample or the self pour is such a cool draw, such a novel concept and a way for people to really interact and test, so what do I like and what do I wanna buy? And this, great. And it can be limited, it can be controlled. You can police with this technology, all the undesirable impacts away. 
But if you do not see your way to, to approving a model like that, then um, to go sale or, or, or sales from the fridge, sales from the fridge, but either to go or sealed to go or consumption on premises with your salad, your rice bowl, your wrap, your whatever. Uh, just like you could have cracked open a Budweiser or Castagnola to eat with your sandwich. Crack open one of these pre-sealed, pre-filled bottles to eat with your, your bimbot bowl. Um, it, it's, it's a distinction without an appreciable difference if you're going to allow outside commercial versus from the taps. And from the taps is what's going to distinguish this and make this a destination for people to come to. So we thank you for your consideration. Uh, please do look at this page 14 that the staff gave you. It's an interesting example of all the CUPs in the area. Let's see, did I leave my litter? I did. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And of course, if you have any questions, please look. Thank you. Uh, so, have any follow up questions? No questions. No. I think maybe I'm looking for some clarification. Um, so originally they came to request 26 seats, which would require more parking. Now we're back to, I, I understand the concept and I agree with the concept. I'm on board with the concept. But now that we're going back to six seats, we're not required more parking, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the six seats is your grandfathered and is legal non conforming. <laughs> <laughs> so the grandfathered in is a legal non conforming six seat to go restaurant. Mm -hmm. So if they're not changing that, frankly, if they just had a cooler, there'd be um there'd be no need for this hearing at all. If they just have you know a beer fridge, the question I think just comes down to whether or not the tap system is compatible with the to-go restaurant. I mean, I think that that's if that's the direction you, you want to go. Right. Okay. Help me out, I, Katie. I should. Yeah, I just want to add one thing. What what is before you tonight is the original application on appeal. That's twenty six seats. Yeah. But they're willing to decrease it. So I think their their request is for the tw the column A of the original application, but then they're willing to cut it gotcha. back to six. Okay, thank so you. Can I clarify? Make a clarifying question yeah. to that then. So then there then we would need to if we were to say that we were okay with the taps, but not the original application of the twenty six seats, we would have to make essentially two votes: one denying the appeal, and then another to allow taps or would we just make one? Cause I mean, how, how does it work if we're kind of splitting, if the whole appeal is for the 26 seats application and we want to say we're okay with one part of this, but not the other, how would we vote on that? If it's not just denying the appeal or accepting the appeal? I, I'm gonna look to Sam. Sure, so it's de novo review. So you can craft whatever you're willing to approve and then that would just be the motion and the vote. We would want to bring you back. We, what we would request is that you give direction to staff as to what you believe is approvable. And then we would return to you at a subsequent meeting with a resolution and findings to support that um, direction. Okay. Okay. And then to make sure I've really answered your question, at that meeting, you would vote on the resolution, which okay. would include your direction. Reflect your direction is a better way to say it. Okay. Okay. Any other clarifying needed? Are we, doing, are we on comments now? Are we still doing questions? Is it possible to interact again? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, it's my understanding that like your first round of analysis is, do we approve the planning commission denial of the application back in December or do we overturn their denial? Okay. Number one, if you approve their denial, yep, that's denied. You don't get a restaurant and cafe with 26 seats. Then you, as, as council said, you go de novo review of the other alternatives. 
what do you like? What do you support? What do you rule? It is not my understanding that, that that's a recommendation to staff. You are the final arbiters. You can decide right now what you want to approve. We get counsel. Um, yeah, that's just not accurate. So, if the as the code says, and as any permit requires, your your the permit needs to be supported by findings. The resolution that staff brought tonight is consistent with staff's recommendation, and so it has findings that support a denial of the appeal. If the council would like to grant the appeal or if the council would like to exercise its authority to do a de novo review and craft a different approval, that will need to be supported by findings. Those findings are not available tonight. So we would need you to give us direction and then staff could bring you findings that would support that direction at a subsequent meeting. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, so we are closing the public hearing. Thank you for everybody's input. Um, so this is a time that we can deliberate and choose our course of action. Where do you want to start? <laughs> Who wants to start? Anybody? I'm happy to start. Okay, great. Um, so first of all, I don't think this is a bar at all. I've been in there. I've seen it. It does not look like a bar. So if that's part of the reason for denial, um, I don't think that makes any sense personally. Um, there are multiple other businesses selling alcohol in mixed use neighborhood zones. Um, there are no laws prohibiting taps from being used in takeout restaurants. Uh, I believe that we need to support our small business community. I would be interested in seeing if we could work out uh, more seats using city parking. And in general, I would support definitely option one and maybe even some sort of a hybrid with more seats. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have concerns with the parking, um, and I and I hear the concerns of the neighbors about the potential for adding the twenty six or going up to twenty six seats. Um, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with the tap system. I would prefer uh, it mentions in there up to or excuse me, it says uh, I think no more than fifty percent of the taps being alcoholic, and I would personally prefer the language to be. Um, something something along the lines to say 50% or less or 40, 49%, right? So essentially the majority of what you're doing would need to be non-alcoholic and then the rest is alcohol. That's fine with me. Um, but I feel like in the same way that, you know, the threshold for a vote is always 50 plus, plus one for something to pass, the threshold for something to not be a majority alcoholic business should be 50 minus one. Um, so I, that's just a preference of me personally, but I don't have a problem with the tap system necessarily, but I do have a problem with the additional seating. Um, and honestly, I think, you know, if we were to move forward with the approval of the tap system after that, it's out of our hands anyway, it's up to ABC to decide if, you know, the rest of the permitting is, is to their liking. So that's where I'm at right now. I'm interested in hearing what the rest of the council thinks as well. Yeah, well, so let me just start with, I, I wanna thank staff for really doing your, this is your job to follow our code, to implement our code. And I, I definitely appreciate all the time that was put into this and it's reflected here. Um, but with that being said, we're here to also review some things that may be old standards or things that we've never thought about, um, such as Capitola Avenue um, becoming such a hot, kind of area. We have several businesses that are thriving on Capitola Ave right now. And now we have somebody who wants kind of in on that um, opportunity. And as we, I mean, we just had almost the entire Esplanade go underwater. Um, and so when we're seeing businesses trying to push back and be successful just out of that 
corridor, um, I'd like to see that kind of growth take place so that essentially we can thrive as a city and continue to, um, to support our businesses in that matter. So um, I respect staff. I respect what our planning commission did because that's their job to follow those rules and to follow um, the, the codes essentially. So they just did their job. So someone had mentioned, you know, that they could have done it something. No, they were just simply following the, the rules as is. So I just want to be mindful of that. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to find a middle ground here. I think that with the times, um, you know, were mentioned that we're coming out of COVID, you're trying to respond, you're trying to um, find the niche of a business that's going to be successful, because that's what we all want in our community is a business to be successful. And so I don't know, I, I don't think that there, as the original application as presented makes the best sense with 26 seats, because we don't know if the model essentially is going to work. And we don't want, I'd, I'd rather not have the business go into that full throttle with, um, without really knowing how effective and how, and how great of a success you would be. So I'm looking at the option one as presented. I like the self-pour option with the 16 taps. Um, I think that we would, with, with the minimum of the six seats, or excuse me, yeah, the six seats, with Council Member Brown's um, percentage of 49% or less as non-alcoholic taps as they wrap around, I'm visualizing. Obviously this would be, um, what I'd like to see come back is really clear picture on the system. So how, what does the tasting look like? What does the sit and drink aspect look like? What is the to go? We haven't seen any of that presented today, um, obviously because you're waiting on some sort of response from us, but to have that visually um, in front of us or to hear about that on a report that comes back from staff, that would be really helpful. And again, this would be on the condition of whether ABC passes this as a takeout, um, as an addition to the takeout, uh, what is this called? Um, yeah, the, the C, the type 4C license, that's what it's called. Um, so as long as that's in alignment, and then it'll be interesting to see what they say with the kitchen. I you use a lot of different examples. I brought up a lot of different examples of how this is successful with other businesses in the general area. Again, I, I would like to see what is um, what ABC and what the kitchen would look like. So overall, that's the how I would like staff to bring it back for us to... Um, to determine at a later date. So again, it's the option one with the self-pour of 16 taps, six seats, 49% or less. Um, be really clear on what the system is for tasting, sit down and drinking to go, that sort of stuff. Um, and that that is all I have for now. Can I clarify something in yes. that really quickly? Yeah. I think the 16 taps is listed here are the ones that would be beer and wine. So if we wanted it to be less than 50, it would need to be 15 taps. Okay. Because the other, right? Because 16 is half of the total taps and then, yeah. So it would be 15 taps total for beer and wine consumption, which would leave 17. I I won, I because I I think I heard the pellet say they purchased it already. Like it's what? already, the all of the taps are embedded yeah, they're in already. Place. Yeah. And so it would just be 15 of them would be alcohol and then the others would not be. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Got it. Because mm -hmm. it. it already exists as a non-alcoholic yeah. system. I see. I mm -hmm. see. Okay. Um, and I think that's a good start. I would feel comfortable with that. Trying that out. We're in support of businesses here. We want to see businesses thrive. I mean, and I think additionally, what we need to think about as a council is that corridor, Capitola Avenue corridor. You know, we've built code that doesn't allow for this kind of um, businesses um, because that's how it was, you know, before. But now we're seeing from the cork and fork to Avenue Cafe of businesses really being successful there. And I think we just need to acknowledge that and look at our code at a different time when staff has time to, to support that. So um, after the yeah. four other things we've directed to yeah. tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't we vote? And then try to make recommendations, or should we try to amend? Well, we're going to need to 
speak on what we would like to vote on specifically, I think. Um, yeah. Do you have any points? No, I think it, uh, I thought we were here just to vote on either the recommendation for or against. Maybe then they can come up with staff and ideas of how to um, rework another application. Well, I think we need to put forth what we're going to be comfortable approving. Okay. Um, I just have a couple things to touch on that. Um, again, I, I, I'm interested to see how this can work um, and how we can move forward. Um, uh, I, I think I just need to touch on a couple things. A big word that's coming to mind is consistency. I am down in this village pretty much every day and I often don't see you open. So I just wanna make sure that you're going to be utilizing this space to the fullest extent, provided you have um, you know, these greater things that you're able to do. Um, the regulation, um, I've worked in food and beverage service for an immense amount of time, and it is something that you really have to be on top of. So staffing, um, I'm excited to see that you would probably be able to staff this with a few people looking at um, how this uh, proposal is set up. You're going to need people to be monitoring folks that are in there consuming the alcohol um, or taking them off premise. Um, I would like to see, you know, going in line with what other places do have available with their takeout options is these outdoor seats. Um, so we're talking about six indoor. I don't know what that would look like if you're having tables out side, um, but I also don't want to throw too much in there right away. So I don't know how council feels looking, about that as well. You're looking at the 26 seat one. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So the question is, are, are the six seats including the outsiders outside seating? Right. Yeah. Or right now they have it set up where the six seats are the four at the bar and two at the other outside. But if the fire marshal occupancy is like 30 for that building, that doesn't mean you can only have six people in there. Yeah, you, she could put six seats inside and have people stand at the bar outside. Okay, okay. Um, right, or however she chooses to. Yeah, put okay, so I understand that. And then to um, please be mindful of the neighbors and any work that you're doing that um, is not being permitted. Um, um, I would just frown upon that. Obviously, so um, let's do this as by the book as we can um, to avoid any any issues that may come from that. Um, so how how do we want to move this? Can we do two motions? Okay. We have more stuff. Um, actually, I just want to. Um, I'm hearing a few things about possibly. Um, the applicant coming back with a mod modifications. If if that is what the council is looking for, I think that's a continuation. Um, but if you want to make a motion on this project tonight, if, if you want to uh, take action on it, you do have a set of plans in front of you that you can approve and limit in in additional ways if you'd like. But um, I just want to be clear that if you're if you want another, I'm hearing you'd like to see more information and study it further. It would it be more appropriate to? I look so at, let me be clear with what then I'm asking for because I'm not trying to modify anything. Actually, I think we're reducing what the original application was, essentially, right? So it's pretty much staying status quo with the implementation of the TAP system, mm -hmm. and so we could have staff bring back that written up. Um, with the TAP system implementation, with the language of the 49% or less, and really clear language on what the system entails for the TAP system. I don't know that I need a study. I just would like that to be written in when we receive the report for approval. Um, so that that's what I meant. Not okay. like, um, tell me where you're sitting and what kind okay. of beer you're serving. I, I was thinking you wanted yeah. an, an amended uh, floor plan, so I apologize. Yeah, no. And oh, I, no. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. 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 So the, and I, I felt like the appellant was really um, 
interested in knowing our take on the self for. And so that's why I included that language that it should be it should be self for um, as an option for okay. that for them. It, so that essentially it, is what you're asking. That that's clear. And then I just wanted to clarify. Um, at this site, there was an outdoor proposal in, back in 2019 on the side of the lot that was denied because of impacts to the neighbors right. behind them. Um, I would suggest in when we bring back conditions that we think about that space and, and ensuring that that's not an area that the public could utilize. And then I also think that the applicant's proposal to limit the hours is, should be probably be built into the conditions where this is in a neighborhood mixed use That's really rather helpful. than the village if you're up so right there's an eight o'clock closing, closing, closing time so I think we can include that as well mm -hmm. um and then with the number of seats which is six I mean that's six seats inside with no chairs outside is what because there's like a standing area nothing on the side I'm looking at or that. they could put the six seats outside of the standing area, but then there's standing room only inside. Do you need that? I mean, that them. feels That's a little them, right? So, so we've, we've moved away from counting seats, right? The six seats is tied to the old permit. We now have allowances for up to 160 square feet within a to-go restaurant today to kind of move away from those six seats. But you, you're welcome to keep the condition of six seats. But what I'm saying is before you is a restaurant application with up to 26. So if you want to increase that number, it would just be classified as a restaurant and not right. a to-go. And that's why we're not adding yep. more than six not so that they six. don't require more parking variances. Okay. Right. So that's why we're sticking with six. Where they put them doesn't matter. But they're now permitted as a restaurant. No. Is that what I'm understanding? No. It'll okay. still be considered. We'll with with okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Got confused. My bad. So we're okay. sticking with six in order for them not to be a restaurant, which does not require a variance. So yeah. it would be the allowance to be continue to be a takeout with type four license to have a tap or system that they can self for with 49% or less. Um I think that's really all they need. There's no other additional variance they need because we're not, my, what I'm proposing is that we don't add more than six seats so that we don't need to require more parking. Thank you. Yeah. So, okay. so do we so need to make a motion, a motion or? I, I think I'm, I'm looking to Director Hurley and Brian to my right to see if you have what you need to um, make the required findings. And if so, I think we'll bring back a resolution at a subsequent meeting. And I think that might be all we need. It, I'm looking to see if you need additional direction. I, I think it's clear. So uh, Brian, do you need any additional direction? And may I, Mayor, just one more thing with those findings that you need to find. You brought up good points about eight o'clock closing, are we missing anything else? I'm going to look to, is question. there, yeah. you know, in order we, so we don't have to do this back and So forth. the eight o'clock closing also uh, limitations to not allow the side <coughs> yard to be utilized. Also on the original permit, uh, the planning commission, when they allowed this to change from uh, retail to, to a restaurant, they asked that the venting system be towards the front of the uh, go out towards the street rather than to the residents in the back. So we would want to continue to have that out of for courtesy to the neighbor. Yeah, and I, I think I did read somewhere about signage, but I just would like to reiterate that the signage will have to be super clear as far as open container laws and um, restricted area, and then possibly some good neighbor signage about you know park no parking in the trestle parking lot and things like that um but that might just be extra and for clarification for the um appellant it is once permit is in hand that these changes can be made and she can then go to abc until that time no changes okay one more thought, um, you know, the appellant did bring up the um, parking and that we we also look at alternatives to parking. And so if you wanted more bicycle parking on the site or something like that, we could make sure that's incorporated into the 
I mean, there's definitely space. Right. Now you just, right? <laughs> My mind, right? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about the bike. Who's in for another I, hour? I know. Alex loves his bikes. He's in. I, I have a couple of comments, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, not about the parking. I, I am interested in uh, seeing if we can work with businesses to utilize our city parking lots, but I think that's a conversation for a different day. Um, what I wanted to talk about this, though, I think um, changing it from 16 taps to 15 taps alcoholic seems kind of arbitrary. I would definitely err on the side of giving the business more freedom to pursue um, you know, what they think they need to thrive as a small business. Um, and I also wouldn't limit necessarily 100% um, of guests utilizing the outdoor space. I think that's also unnecessarily restrictive. I don't, I don't think, think we're not that. we're not preventing the guests from using the outdoor space. I think that was something Katie was suggesting that we the side oh the side oh, patio yeah that's that's facing yeah. the residential yeah and I like I I I would in or because this has gone through such a process with the community already yeah and we've received so much feedback I think as a middle ground yeah. that it would make sense to be respectful of the residents that live there on the side I I mean. I can only envision someone drinking a growler out there, having a chit chat in front of someone's window. But I mean, there, there's a residential spot right there, and I, I don't I'm feel not, comfortable with that. The area was um, between the tap house and the trestle. It's like a big open area, right? And then there's some house. There's, yeah, a, there's, house, there's a house like there's right houses. here. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was just directly to the left was the area in question, not behind. That's a ref, that's a refuse area. The garbage area. Well, but regardless, that was de denied previously. That right. was denied, right? Previously. Yeah, and it yeah. wasn't Whereas, part of this application. And it's not part of this application. I just um, my suggestion is within the conditions, we should prevent spillover from happening into that area, possibly by like re requiring established landscaping in that area that or people like wouldn't a bike. Yeah, and have bike, bike, yeah, bike parking. Yeah. Okay, I see um, where it one, one other item that uh, the appellant and I would like clarified is, you, are, we, are they allowed to use their system or is somebody, do they have to pour the alcohol? It seems like what I'm hearing is she can utilize the system that um, they have in place with the cards and that's, you're not saying. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's, okay. the that's self, what I meant self by self-pour. Yeah. yeah, self-pour. With the regulations that it's... Right. To, oh, well, I guess you didn't... Sorry, didn't never mind. That, right? I, I, I wouldn't... Yeah. Right here. Okay. Yeah, never mind. Sorry. Like a big open area. Um, and there's no limit on the not, amount of... What you're talking about. Right, so like, not an option one. I think that I mean, ABC will... Like yeah, following that. the ABC. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Katie, I, I'm sorry. I know you're walking away, but I, it's your <laughs> fault. You've mentioned bikes. And so if we wanted to keep folks out of that area, but maybe utilize that side space for some bike parking or something like that, I think that would be really neat um, mm -hmm. to look at. So um, are you suggesting we require oh, it? I don't want to make it required, though. Did, I just think it's a great idea. Did we have specific complaints about um, using that area for drinking? We did. Yeah, okay. Okay. You you can require it if you'd I like that's as part nice. of the parking variance. Yeah, but there's no parking variance. So it sounds like what council is expressing is some concern about the impacts of the project on the neighborhood, and so and certainly the council has given um, uh, direction in how to mitigate those, and so those will be captured. That direction will be captured in the conditions, and the concern will be captured in the findings. Right. Okay. So are we making a motion? It or is, this is the direction. It, I, I think staff has sufficient direction. I'm looking to the staff that will be writing this and making okay. sure they have okay. sufficient direction. Next meeting. Yeah, I was thinking that too. Can we just vote now? Or I mean, if it if do we really need more information on this? I mean, yeah, we do have it does have to come back to us because we don't have findings 
in the ordin ordinance resolution resolution in the resolution that was brought to us in the packet so typically when we do something like this they'll write up a resolution assuming this is staff recommendation if you go with it we're going to vote on this resolution well that's not what we just told them so they have to write a new resolution but for tonight if it makes everyone feel better i would be willing to make a motion to say we will uphold the original planning commission denial of the original application and provide an allowance for option one as listed by staff um, with the allowance of up to 15 taps serving uh, on-site beer and wine consumption through a self-pour system. Does that, if I were to have just made that motion, would that satisfy the legal <laughs> requirements? I think there's a lot more, but <laughs> that's certainly not wrong. I think that's fine. I think that's fine if the, the council doesn't need to vote on a motion, but if you would like to, that would be a good one. Would, it, would the council prefer that there be a vote? You want to vote on it? Okay, I just made that just motion. Okay. I just made that. I'll motion. second that. Okay. So is this coming back to us at all then? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Right, yes. Right. There will be a resolution okay, and you'll vote. The resolution will be on consent and you'll vote on it again then. It's just a pre-vote. Yeah, well, if we vote on the resolution, we're going to practice yeah. our voting skills tonight. <laughs> okay. Hours. I'm ready to vote on something. Okay, let's vote. Uh, first and second roll call, please. Aye. Uh, no, based on staff and other things, uh, no. Okay. Aye. 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 That is a four to one. We will move on to our. I have to take a. I know. Yeah. Can yeah. Take a break? Do, yeah. Let's do it. Go to our live real quick. Everybody else get set up. Um, five minute break. Yeah. Dickle potty. Whew. There's only two stalls, though. The long uh, Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's running for their stalls. I know. Now we're going to be like 10 minutes before we get back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hot mic. Is this thing on? Yeah, I I've done my best to like keep this from happening, but thank you. <laughs> Hmm? Oh, is our primary goal I, I have no idea. Like, I don't know. I'm just talking about it. But it kind of pick, picked it up because it wasn't. We could that, 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 that scary. Yeah. Hi. Anyway. Yeah. They're much better now. <laughs> I know. In the chair day. Four hours. I, we haven't had a four-hour council meeting in a long uh, time. Uh, yeah. Oh. And can you imagine, though? Set a precedent. Right? Can you imagine, though, when the meeting started at 7? It would be 11 o'clock right now. Right. That's what I think about yeah. every time. I'm kind of glad we moved it to 6 now. No kidding. I've been glad since day one. Thank you, Katie. No. Almost. Do it. Oh, we've got a majority of it. I know. I need the majority. <laughs> Ready, set. The mayor's here. We can get started. All right. I'd like to welcome everybody back for our last item before I start adding items, just for fun. <laughs> All right. 
So item 8D, Kennedy Drive sidewalk project. About to. Quiet on the set. <laughs> okay. Our action yeah, here, right. the recommended action is to approve the plans, specifications, and yeah, construct. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Sorry, that guys. Serious. Let's, let's I get through it. I it was going to happen, and I jumped. Well yeah. done. Let's get through it. <laughs> All right. All right. Good evening again, Mayor and Council. <laughs> We're going to make this really brief. <laughs> All right. Can you drive sidewalk project? Come on, sit there. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so this project is a um, sidewalk infill project on Kennedy Drive. It was a project that was identified during the public scoping session for McGregor Park and was awarded an RTC grant in the Regional Transportation Program funding in 2021. Uh, the goal of this uh, particular project is to eliminate conflicts between bicycles, vehicles, and pedestrians on this portion of uh, Kennedy Drive. Uh, it includes pedestrian improvements of a sidewalk, crosswalk, striping, an ADA curb ramp, and a new place to bike lane. Uh, so this is the current condition here on Kennedy Drive. This is looking downhill. Um, right now, it's just a two-lane road um, with an asphalt shoulder, and there's parking lot on both sides, so it is not typically fully utilized. Uh, this here is the new proposed configuration going from left to right. It is a bike lane, a two drive aisles, a buffer parking on one side of the street and a sidewalk. Um, you know what? That was the same thing, but in a drawing. <laughs> this <laughs> this uh, next item is the striping plan. So you can see the beginning of that uphill uh, bike lane on that side of the road. There's no parking on that side of the road to avoid conflicts with opening doors. And then on the downhill side, there is a sharrow. You're going faster on a bike when you're going downhill. So that's why you chose the sharrow for that side of the street. With the sidewalk the striping there you can kind of see in the grayed out where the uh, existing striping is that'd be taken out to provide striping to all improved walkways so there across from um, on park avenue there is a bus stop and an access to the beach and then there is a sidewalk going up park avenue i'm um, going uphill um we have the share a transition, the bike lane transitions to a Shero uh, to avoid conflicts with the driveways there. And then there is a connection to the existing sidewalk on the side street. Um, do it, putting in this sidewalk does uh, necessitate the removal of 15 parking spaces. Again, since this project was proposed about a year ago, staff has been actively uh, monitoring the parking on this stretch of roadway. It is very rarely halfway utilized and even rarer fully utilized. There is also parking on both sides of the street in the adjacent neighborhood. Um, again, the funding is partially coming from the RTC. The council um, allocated $25,000 in funding in fiscal year 21-22, some of which was spent on the design work and there's 17,000 available left for construction. Um, the schedule for this project, uh, there is a CDP application involved, which was part of the staff report. There's an appeal period on that where we couldn't construct prior to that. Uh, this project, since it is being funded by the RTC, needs to go to their elderly and disabled technical advisory commission and bicycle advisory commission meetings, which are the first and second week of April. Um, we don't anticipate them having major comments on this project, but if they do, we will bring it back to council. We can then bid the project in May and construct it in June. And there are the recommended actions, and I can answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Do council members have any questions? I did have a, a question. Um, most projects, when we go out, we get some public input. I know this is something everybody wants, but there's some different ideas about what they want and how it's going to best um, be dealt with the people that live in the immediate area. Um, so I was just wondering if we could maybe put it back for some public um, comment for you know, a meeting to see what's going to happen to, to the people that live right in the neighborhood. There's been a few people that have approached me that shared some concern about that. Sure. Our typical process is to have a public meeting um, in order to get this, basically this project done with the other projects with FEMA and the other projects the council has in their goals and priorities. Uh, we chose not to do a public meeting for this one. This project is not adjacent to any frontages of any property. So it seemed like a rather safe one not to, but yes, the uh, Staff has the ability 
to go back and do a public meeting, I will say that kind of closes the window um, for getting this constructed in the in the early summer. I also want to add this requires a coastal development permit. So we did send out notice to all um, residents within 300 feet, letting them know of this meeting tonight and the public hearing. To and posted on along the street. So just, we did try to get the word out there in order for people to participate this evening. You live in the neighborhood. It doesn't even work. You guys get adequate. Um, I, I would say, I, if you want me to respond to our council member, he, um, he asked if I oh, received any. I'm so sorry. Public, do you want me to respond? Of course. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, when we, we actually had a lot of staff out there um, looking at it and a lot of the neighbors came out and actually supported and we're really thrilled to, to see it. Um, we did re receive one correspondence of concern, but they just misunderstood the project. Um, and I believe staff followed up with that particular person Great. and cleared it up. So I think we're- Good to hear. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? We can take this to public comment. Where'd everybody go? <laughs> Anybody online? Great. We do have a public comment. Oh my God. <laughs> still awake great feel free to uh, this is, hey guys me again uh this is a great idea so the more sidewalks the better the more bike lanes the better uh you should approve this and get it done and we're not even paying for it it's like a win thank you thank you anybody else online okay let's go back to council for deliberation or motion I'll move approval of the recommended action. I'll second that. Great. We have a motion and a second. So maybe we have a roll call, please. Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. That'll take us to item nine, adjournment. Thanks to everybody for hanging out with us for four hours. Woo! Oops. I think that was, are they cut?